allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. <laughs> Okay, the primary uh, purpose of today's meeting is a uh, presentation on the waste, municipal wastewater treatment proposal. But before we go to that, we'll start with uh, Amber, our COVID update. Uh, yes, I've got the numbers for this week. Um, locally, we have um, 125 um, total cases since inception, up 10 from 115. Um, it is a big jump, but we're anecdotally hearing about fewer cases this week. So I think that um, hopefully things are flattening out. The states, um, the county's positivity rate from last week to this week is 25.9% to 26.4%. So it was an increase of 0.5%. So that's starting to level out. And actually, the past couple of days, um, the positivity rate has been below the 26.4%. So hopefully, um, things are starting to settle down a little bit. Hospitalizations, we're still towards the high end of the curve there, but that's always a lag, um, lagging indicator. So hopefully that will start to go down as well. Okay, and, and the one thing that uh, the three of us, you, myself, and Jimmy have discussed is uh, because of all the home tests, we're really not getting a, a true number on how many people are actually sick. So it's just something, uh, again, it's the same thing, you know, just be aware, be careful, don't, uh, don't assume anything. Uh, we have been getting some calls on the Fitz Center. You know, people are kind of upset that it's closed, but we decided we would finish out this week and next Monday we'll make a determination uh, going forward what we're going to do. I think that, Chief, did you have anything else on your numbers? No, but I, I just wanted to add this. Uh, as we enter the winter season, um, there are uh, calls. We haven't seen any in our community for the most part, but other communities provide warming shelters and our senior service is our warming shelter. So I would just put out to the community, if there's ever a need, um, you can always reach out to the police department for a place to go. But during the daylight hours, we use our senior uh, center as a warming shelter for anybody that may need it. And we're pretty cognizant of uh, those without power or those with any special needs. But after hours, if something should happen, please don't hesitate to call the police department, especially during these, uh, frigid temperatures. So I just wanted to put that out publicly and, and, and let the community know. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, next on the uh, agenda, I just wanna give an update. The uh, blood drive that was scheduled for January 20th this year is gonna be rescheduled. Uh, the uh, Red Cross feels that it's not, it's not a good time to do this. And I don't think it would be productive enough for them to come out and try to get it done now, but we will go forward with it. And we'll wait to hear from them. Uh, okay, before we start the next thing, I just want to read uh, the rules of public participation here, because I think, you know, this is going to, this topic will be going on for, you know, a number of weeks, and I just want to make sure, you know, we have some semblance of order going forward so we can uh, uh, make the most of it. The town, and this is also posted on the website, the town board asks that all attendees treat this process and each other with dignity and respect and keep the following in mind. The work session shall be open for public viewing. Information regarding attendance via Zoom can be obtained from the town website. The Zoom link is also available on the town website under the government tab if you go to the town board meetings. Public comments will, comments will be permitted at the end of the presentation. Comments shall be accepted in the following order. Town board, invited committee chairs and members, and then the general public. All comments are limited to the subject being discussed. The town board shall have the first opportunity to raise questions and comments. <laughs> Invited committee members may ask questions once the town board has completed its discussion. After this, they will be allotted a single three minute opportunity to express any opinion should they so choose. Following this question and answer, each member of the public will have one three minute opportunity to speak. This limit does not apply to presenters placed on the agenda by the board nor does it prohibit anyone from responding to a question from the board. All comments should be addressed directly to the board and not to any other member of the public. The board or presenter may choose whether or not to respond to a comment or question. If the board responds, 
The commentator may speak for an additional minute in reply. <clears throat> Please refrain from shouting, repeatedly raising non-agenda items, distracting audible side conversations or interrupting the speaker. You are free to express your opinions. However, violence, threats, slurs, defamation, intimidation, profanity, or unruly and disruptive behavior are not acceptable, contrary to the purpose of public discourse, and may lead to removal from the meeting or being electronically muted. The chat feature on Zoom shall be disabled for all electronically conducted meetings. It should not be used if it inadvertently left on. So I just want to have some semblance of order as we go forward. The purpose of today's meeting is the town board had put out a uh, request for proposals. We got a uh, re request in. We got a grant to do a study in the center to see uh, what we need to do with our uh, very significant nitrogen problem. Uh, the study was done. Lombardo Associates made a, uh, a full report uh, to Joe Fenora, our town engineer. Joe presented it to the town board. And I, I just want to say the first time the town board saw it was the same time the public saw it. I mean, Joe told me what the concept was, but we didn't go into anything, any kind of detail until the actual presentation was made. So the presentation was made to the public uh, just to get everybody to understand, you know, what the pro project was. Now, today we're going to start the next phase of it is to have Joe give a, a quick synopsis of what we're going to do. And then we want to hear from all our committees, uh, concerns, questions, uh, thoughts, whatever. Okay. So, Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, is it possible for me to share a screen? Yep. Christina? Go ahead, Joe. Okay. Can you, uh, can you see this? Uh, PDF that's in front of everyone. Yeah, if you could just make it a little bit bigger, if you could. Sure, sure. Okay, so my uh, my plan for uh, this afternoon is to very quickly walk through orally, uh, explaining the concept of our project, some background information, and I'm going to use the presentation that was offered by Lombardo Associates. Uh, when they came to uh, came to town back in mid December, uh, really just as a, a resource, a visual resource here, I intended really to scroll through it uh, and not not let this be a um, uh, you know a duplicate type presentation. So um, so starting here at the top, uh, like Jerry had said, um, this project is funded by two grants: so New York State DEC uh, providing a portion of the funds, and then also uh, Suffolk County water quality improvement projects providing additional funding. Uh, the scope of the project is to first examine the, the feasibility of a wastewater management plan for our center municipal buildings. Uh, that's the, the, the point at which we are in the project right now. We've received our uh, initial engineering report examining a number of potential solutions and the project also allows for us to progress to design phase. So it's funded through, uh, through design. Uh, and we have stopped now after our initial engineering report to evaluate the options that were presented as part of the initial feasibility study and to uh, receive public uh, comment and for the committees to contribute based off of their uh, expertise to make a ultimately make a recommendation with how to proceed. Uh, so uh, scrolling through here, <clears throat> you'll see that the, the buildings included in the scope of the project are all of the municipal, all of the municipal buildings here, you know, at the center of town, uh, the public library, the uh, fire department, youth center, uh, American Legion, the assessor's building, town hall building, the town owned resident, uh, residential housing ad directly adjacent to town hall, the police department, the justice court, and the high school. And the engineering study initially sought to identify what the contributions are uh, from those respective buildings uh, to understand what size uh, treatment or what, what style treatment would be available to us. 
Uh, they then looked at a number of our geophysical conditions to understand groundwater flows in the area, uh, what the biggest contributors were to our, our excessive uh, nitrogen groundwater, and ultimately uh, use that information to run through a needs analysis, which would help understand what type of technology would be best suited for this location. We looked at the existing location of septic systems and wells to understand what kind of spatial constraints we might have in combination with property ownership constraints. We then took uh, a further analysis of what sites could be available, either them being town owned uh, wholly or as part of a joint ownership with, uh, with the county to understand what sites could be used for uh, potential treatment and recharge locations. And what we landed on uh, was a gravity fed collection system that would service all of the municipal buildings uh, with a direct connection, uh, concentrating at one pump location and a low pressure force main carrying that effluent down the 114 corridor, extending around uh, man wearing and ultimately landing at a treatment facility and recharge location at the airfield. The treatment technology would be more advanced than what we typically uh, have available to us for residential type wastewater treatment. It would allow us to to treat our wastewater uh, beyond simply uh, removing nitrogen. Uh, we would have the opportunity to adapt the system as our needs changed and also as we understood what our flow characteristics were. And we landed on a couple of uh, cost scenarios based off of the best proposal, which was to go to the airfield. Uh, we looked at what kind of grants might be available to help subsidize the ultimate cost. And the cost on the table now uh, is $3.8 million, exclusive of operating costs. Um, and then we opened up for discussion. I would say that the analysis of sites and treatment type uh, was really centered on finding the best solution. Uh, we have a number of opportunities to pursue this project with different sites, uh, with different gravity feed versus force main type uh, infrastructure. And in, in no situation do I feel that we're faced with a, a bad option, but this can very much be looked at as a, a good, better, best type situation where we've looked at other sites that could be available, um, other styles of collection systems. Uh, but the purpose of the project was not necessarily to find the most, um, uh, the cheapest or the, the quickest, uh, but to find the most effective and sustainable solution for a comprehensive wastewater system for all of our municipal buildings in town. So I really didn't do justice to all of the complexities of the project. Um, and I think the intention is to mostly open uh, this meeting up to conversation and, and uh, question and answer type format. So um, I guess, Jerry, I, I'd hand it back to you if you have any specific questions that the town board would like to, to, to ask or, yeah, uh, or at least to manage. Stop sharing, please, Joe. Joe, I would uh, ask you just real quick to dumb it down a little bit and explain uh, that the only thing going to the airfield is the uh, liquid effluent, that there'll be uh, septics at each uh, building. That's right. So the, the technology that's proposed is what's called a septic effluent system. So each parcel would have a, a septic tank uh, that collects the, the first stage of, uh, of wastewater as it exits the building. Uh, nothing would go in the ground at those locations, but the septic tank would be an opportunity to collect solids on site, similar to how a septic system works on a residential uh, system now, except that instead of having a drain field or a leaching pool on each particular site, any effluent, any liquid that would be passing through the septic system would be captured and sent for treatment. So we would, in this format, not be allowing any 
uh, wastewater to percolate into the ground on a particular site. It would all be carried uh, to one centralized treatment center. Any town board, any questions before uh, we go to the committees? Yeah, I, have, I have one, please. Go ahead. I think your question was uh, one of the two questions I wanted to ask. <clears throat> By dumbing it down, that was a pretty good layman's explanation, Joe, of, of what we're, you know, what how the system works. <clears throat> During your first opening remarks, of the, you talked about finding the best solution. And you talked about three categories. We could find something that's good something that's better and something that's best. I'm assuming that the best in your estimation and, and is where this effluent finally ends up. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that you're thinking the best place for that is the airstrip. So I know you're gonna get questions and, and seems to be the major questions that is where this stuff is going, not about the need for the for the treatment, not about the buildings and the and the eight parcels that we've designated, but I think that question needs to be ans answered. And I have one other thing that I think you need to address. Maybe it's the easier of the two to go first. Is this idea about planning for the future? So you, you, you're talking about putting a system in the ground. We talked a lot about you know three weeks ago the size of the pipe that you're going to have. You know, taking it from point A to point B, and um, and and the people were recommending maybe a larger pipe for expansion. Could you maybe talk about those two points? Uh, my thing as a town board member is that when it comes to expansion, we weren't talking about opening up the homeowners associations. We were talking about the potential growth of the town infrastructure and other things along possibly Route 114. Uh, could you elaborate on those two items? Because I think a fair share of the questions are gonna be about those two things. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned during the, uh, the initial slides we, we went through, there are a number of other sites that uh, could, could be solutions for uh, treatment and, and recharge. Uh, the, the only site that's not considered to be in the center of the island is the airfield. And back to your comment, Jim, about good, better, best. Um, our main objective, the primary objective of the project is to address increasing nitrogen rates, uh, particularly to our center watershed areas. And so part of finding a solution that best addresses that objective is to make sure that any contribution uh, from our wastewater into that center watershed is eliminated. And so the other sites that we considered um, would include the, the space that's directly adjacent to the fire department, uh, the Sachem's Wood uh, area, a lot along 114, uh, the ball field area and Fisk field behind uh, the school district. And I believe there's an adjacent privately owned lot to the uh, library all of those sites have the suitable space and setback meet, would meet potentially setback requirements from the Department of Health. Mm. Uh, there are a few ancillary aspects of those uh, sites for consideration that come into play when ultimately landing on the airfield. The first is that the majority of those sites, and I'm speaking generally, not you know each one received its own consideration on a very detailed level, but generally speaking. All of those sites, uh, aside from the airfield, are space constrained. So even though they fit within the required setback areas now, uh, we don't have a lot of extra space to work with. So the long-term uh, considerations for either expansion or, or uh, adaptation of the system would be very limited uh, based on the amount of space that's available at those other sites. Now, like I said, that's that's generally speaking. There are some sites like Sachem's Woods, for instance, where we have more space than others. Um, but if they do have the suitable space, and even if they were larger, like Sachem's Woods, all of those other sites are still 
uh, centered over what we would consider the, the center uh, watershed. So uh, 114 happens to run along more or less the top of the island, the deepest part of the aquifer, and the place where uh, water tends to stay in the aquifer for the longest period of time. So we're faced with water in that area already having uh, elevated nitrates, in some cases exceeding acceptable levels of nitrates. And so when addressing the primary objective of the project to, to uh, combat those elevated nitrates, we're looking to take any effluent and remove it outside of that watershed. Of all of the sites that were available and considered, the airfield is the only one that's not directly above uh, that high point in the aquifer. And so we are including a treatment process that would significantly reduce the characteristics of the effluent. We're talking about uh, nitrogen reductions in excess of 90%. Uh, we're talking about the ability to remove emerging contaminants like personal care products, PFOs. Um, but I think what's important to consider about um, the effluent that's leaving even this highly treated uh, state is that clean is a very relative term. And what we're considering now or what our situation is now is that all of these buildings effectively are, are outhouses, they're holes in the ground with essentially no treatment. So anything we do is yes, a, a, a tremendous improvement. But even when you're processing effluent through um, a state of the art facility with all of those capabilities uh, to make it clean, it's still not perfectly clean. It's an outrageous improvement, tremendous improvement in quality. Uh, but when, our, when we're reviewing our primary objective of, of trying to provide as much benefit uh, to the nitrogen situation in the center of town, the best way to, uh, to complement that is to remove, remove the contribution to the groundwater uh, entirely. So by relocating to a place that's uh, a different a different watershed. Joe, you use the term expansion, and then you use the term adaptation. Could you explain to the people the difference between those two terms? Sure. Ex expansion correlates directly to a change in um, capacity. So either by uh, adding more uh, users, uh, more parcels or buildings, or by expanding an existing uh, user uh, to have more individual capacity. So uh, if the school was to expand, they would be contributing greater flow, even though they're already on the system. If town hall was to expand, uh, or if the legion was to expand and their capacity to hold people, then their particular, their particular flow contributions would go up. So there are multiple ways for expansion, mm -hmm. um, uh, either by adding new users or by a particular existing user increasing in, in capacity. And then uh, adaptation refers to the ability to change the treatment type. So um, IA systems, for instance, are very much geared towards nitrogen reduction. This type of treatment facility is one that can be adaptable uh, to meet the needs of future uh, either compliance related <clears throat> treatment or just best practice related treatment. So if we wanted to add uh, treatment because we saw that PFOAs were increasing in our wastewater flow, we could add that type of treatment once we realized it. And those types of adaptations generally come at a very low cost once the system is put in place. Okay, my, uh, my last question is, I promise you, is, uh, Explain to the people, because obviously there's a, a, quite a few people on the call here. When we, when we treat this, if, if we, in fact, if we, in fact, decided to go to the airfield after treatment, what would be the difference in what we would be putting into the shallow drain fields there versus what we have going now there now without any treatment uh, moving through that same area? I think that We've had this discussion. I just wanted you to share that with some of the people that are here. Sure. It, you know, um, could I um, could I share my screen again? I think it would be helpful to bring up the the sub watershed plan so uh, folks can visualize a little bit about which way their groundwater is is going.
So this, this drawing down here <clears throat> is the US Geological Survey's most recent subwatershed plan. And what that means is that if rainwater or recharge happens in a particular area uh, on the island, uh, the color-coded map identifies the path with which it will travel until it, it eventually reaches surface waters. Surface waters generally in our situation are, are you know, our surrounding estuaries or harbors, uh, but it can also mean um, enclosed bodies of water like uh, ponds or lakes. And so uh, probably a little bit trickier to see, but you'll notice that the center of the island here, which is what I was referring to before as this 114 uh, corridor, uh, happens to be more or less right at the very top of all of these watersheds. And so uh, not only does it take a very, very long time for this water to be diluted and to uh, eventually exit the aquifer, uh, but it can go in so many different directions now. Uh, we're, opera we're, we're operating within the margins of what this type of analysis could possibly allow. But as you can see, uh, this particular square, which is that 114 corridor, uh, where all of those other sites were considered, happens to be right at the confluence of uh, at least half a dozen different watersheds, the 183, 184, 193, 194, 181. And so as it currently stands, all of our septic contributions from the school town hall land someplace around here and on any given year, <clears throat> uh, that groundwater flow could go this way, could go this way, could go this way. We estimate that the majority of this flow, however, historically goes into the 183 subwatershed, ultimately leads down to this portion of Cockles Harbor. And so if we're, if we're assuming based on this study that our current contributions are going in that direction, uh, the airfield happens to fall in that same watershed. And so, if we were to collect this effluent, treat it, and put it someplace else in the same watershed, we would effectively have no, no net change in the watershed contribution. We're just bypassing uh, one area to another within the same, within the same sub watershed. So uh, in this case, uh, we would be eliminating the highly toxic contributions that we're making now, the untreated uh, cesspool type uh, arrangement and we would be replacing it with, you know, this uh, highly treated, significantly reduced concentration effluent, uh, primarily to the same to the same watershed region. Thank you, Joe. Um, uh, Joe, it's BJ. Um, have ju just looking at that map again. Um, the dump. Mm. Has that been considered? Have we talked about that? I don't remember. As a um, as a location? Yeah, as an alternative. No, gen generally no, uh, and, and that's uh, mostly because of the regulatory issues that surround a closed landfill and the existing and the existing uses. All right. Meg, Amber. Um, yes, I have a couple of questions. We have concerns about putting the effluent back into the center, um, but what's going to happen to the area around the airfield? Um, you know, we're, we're moving it and putting it there. So the homes and, you know, businesses in that area, do we, you know, do we have concerns about what we're doing to that water in that area? We don't. Uh, part of the, part of the analysis <clears throat> in siding at the airfield includes uh, understanding the, the hyperlocal groundwater flow. So uh, exactly what you just described, wh where will this go once we put it into the ground at the airfield? Uh, we Right now, our, our uh, initial results show that uh, because of the space that we have at the airfield uh, and the generally lower density in the area, uh, that we don't have any particular concerns about any downstream um, influence. Uh, our proximity to uh, Cockles Harbor, and like I said, generally the, the lower density of the area doesn't show uh, very many, if any, people in the path of, um, of the recharge area. Um, that being said, 
any of these other sites that we considered closer to uh, the center, if not in the center, uh, generally are surrounded by a much more higher high density housing year round residents who also rely on well water. So um, we would generally have a much greater concern for locating this in the center uh, rather than at the airfield because of space. That being said, all of those folks that reside in the area of these municipal buildings now, um, they're vulnerable to the contributions that are being made you know, presently. Those municipal buildings are functioning with cesspools and untreated uh, waste for the most part. So if we were to put this site in the ground at the center, you know, it would certainly represent an immediate improvement from the status quo. Um, but overall, you know, we, we don't feel that's the best siting because of the higher density uh, that's just inherently you know, in, in the center area near, near those municipal buildings. Another question that I have is getting it closer to Cockles Harbor and the fact that I, it's my understanding marine life is more sensitive to nitrogen um, in nitrates. Are we, are we tipping the balance in a bad way for marine life in that area? No, um, what's important to consider with this type of, uh, with this type of project and understanding impacts is, is the scale of the contribution. So uh, the, the treatment plant now would have a capability of uh, six to 10,000 gallons per day uh, by design. And as a scale of uh, recharge or uh, groundwater flow, uh, time, time from the recharge location to Cockles Harbor is still on the scale of, of years, if not decades. Uh, so we're not talking about any sort of a direct flow route into Cockles Harbor. In fact, that in itself is unique. Most wastewater treatment plants um, have direct, direct uh, discharge in, into surface waters, whether it be uh, an outfall or uh, you know, sub subterranean outfall. Uh, the Riverhead plant, the, the Heights plant, they, they operate on an outfall system. So this would already be recharged into the ground. And that would <clears throat> significantly slow and dilute any sort of any sort of impact. Um, the other question, I'm sorry, what was your other question? Oh, about uh, marine life and whatnot. So, uh, 10,000 gallons per day, you know, being on the high side of what we're considering now, you know, we would estimate that the normal groundwater flow uh, into Cockles Harbor is on a scale of hundreds of thousands of gallons per, per day in normal conditions. Uh, when considering the full, you know, the full shoreline perimeter. As part of our fresh pond study, for instance, uh, we now understand that fresh pond in itself as a water body is receiving about 200,000 gallons per day of groundwater flow from our aquifer into the pond. Uh, and that's just part of the natural cycle. So when we're looking at a place like Cock Cockles Harbor and trying to understand what the impact is of, of us siting this plant, uh, you know, we're talking about a, an insignificant contribution in terms of total flow uh, versus what's already happening over there. Something that that's um, you know not even it wouldn't even be considered a rounding error uh, based off its scale. Um, when I looked at the the report that I was looking at was the one that's posted on the website, but the slide that you had earlier shows a slightly different location at the airfield as to where um, this you know, his treatment system would be. So I'm just curious, like, which one is correct and how big of an area will it be, you know, will be covered? I didn't see any pictures in the report of what it would look like on the ground. And I'm, you know, so what does it look like? How big is it going to be? And then what kind of operations would be taking place there? Would it be daily, monthly, quarterly? Just so to understand that. Right. The, the specific siting within the airfield has not been done as part of the study thus far. That type of, uh, of detailed location would happen during the design phase. Um, we, have, uh, we have taken a boring uh, for soil sampling, and we understand that there is some topography across the, uh, across the airfield that would make particular sections more advantageous than others. There's some high ground, there's some low ground. Uh, so those specific details would be worked out during the design phase. We know from the boring that uh, the soil characteristics are, are generally very favorable. I know that in uh, previous meetings, there was some concern about uh, excessive uh, clay levels or 
or some uh, inability for suitable drainage there. And that does not seem to be the case thus far. Uh, the soil seems to be very suitable for, for draining, it's quite sandy. And the groundwater uh, elevation is at about nine feet. So uh, we don't estimate there would be any trouble with, um, with locating a, a shallow drain. It would be a shallow drain field and we would have no, uh, no, no concerns with groundwater flow in that area. Um, the, um, the total size of the site uh, would, would change uh, in terms of the drainage field they, once, once we understand what the, the final design is, but that part would be underground. Uh, so that would have no impact visually or functionally to the site. Uh, the only structure or uh, change aesthetically to the to the site, and this is for any for any location, not not just the airfield, uh, would be a small structure on a scale of 400 to 600 square feet, and that has the potential to also be underground, uh, but is uh, at least initially preferred to be above ground for accessibility, and that's where the treatment equipment would be. Um, any any other. Uh, controls that would need to be more readily accessible would be inside that structure. Uh, and so there's, you know, certainly at this stage, quite a bit of flexibility as to where that goes on the site. Uh, and we're still understanding, uh, you know, what the, the, the nitty gritty of the site would have for us. And we know that there are some, there is some low ground and there's some high ground, some wooded area as well. Um, so we're still looking into those details. Operationally, um, there's a requirement for testing and um, for quality control. Uh, right now, uh, we estimate conservatively, conservatively being a higher frequency, that that would need to be done uh, about twice per week, um, depending on the performance and the, uh, and the regulatory impact, it may be able to be reduced to as little as uh, once per week or um, a few times per month. So there's some flexibility in that. Uh, right now, we're estimating uh, about twice per week, and that would be a single a single person, um, you know, accessing the site with the regular vehicle. That's all that I had for now. So, um, I it's Meg Larson. I have um like a bunch of different questions. Just about the report in general, I feel like it really only recommends one type of treatment system. And I know that there are many types of treatment systems out there. Um, so have we explored other types of systems? Um, like I know that when we did uh, the housing tour of Southampton, they have their own sewage treatment plant for their housing developments. Um, you know, have we considered something like that? Um, just out of curiosity. Um, and then do we have other well water sample tests? Like, do we have nitrate data from other wells in the center of town or more samples? Because in the study, there's really only five samples cited. Um, and I'm wondering if we have better data on the nitrate levels in the center of town. Okay, so uh, backing up to your, your first question about um different treatment types. Yes, there are you know, countless types of treatment uh, technologies and systems that are available. Uh, there's a couple of reasons how this got uh, narrowed. The first is that we have to work within the confines of what's approved and considered acceptable by Suffolk County. So you know, there may be hundreds or if not thousands of different proprietary systems that are available, but um, Suffolk County only recognizes and allows a very narrow subset of those Within those that Suffolk County does allow, um, a number of them are not considered to be uh, newer or high level treatment technologies. They are uh, more generally accepted, and I, I, I'd hate to use the word antiquated, but they're, they're not space saving or high performing type systems. They're the type of systems that are best suited for very, very large scale type sewage treatment. Uh, certainly not, on, um, not for consideration of small you know, housing developments or complex. So uh, removing those, you still yet again have a pretty narrow uh, subset of, of treatments. And then thirdly, uh, the type of treatment that's recommended here is uh, really only one portion of the type of treatment. The actual full treatment 
spectrum and, and plan would be developed in design phase as we are understanding what the flow char uh, characteristics are and, and what additional components we might need to add if it's treatment for personal care products or um, pharmaceuticals. You know, those, those are customizable type treatment mm -hmm. protocols. Um, the treatment system and the technology that we have now has been accepted by Suffolk County and is in use successfully within Suffolk County uh, in a number of places. So we feel that there's a, a precedence and a performance uh, standard uh, example that's, that's uh, well-defined. Uh, as for the nitrogen testing, um, the town has a, a number of mechanisms with which we understand the, the nitrogen condition, some more formal than others, but the scope of this project was not really to map the extent of the nitrogen problem. We advanced the project with the general consensus that you know, there is a nitrogen problem across the center uh, and specifically defining those limits and those boundaries was not, was not part of the scope of this, um, but really just the premise with which we would be uh, considering this system for implementation. Thank you. You're muted, Jerry. It's odd for somebody else to say it besides me. Uh, anything else from the town board? No, sir. Okay, so we'll open it up to the committees. Uh, just uh, raise your hand if you want to speak, and uh, if just like if you could just identify yourself, so that the paper. Uh, sometimes it's easier to, uh, to say who you are and which committee you're representing. Howard, you want to start? Just unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Howard. Okay. Got it. Okay, yep. good. Thank you. Um, yes, I had a couple of questions. Um, but I think the, the, the design intent is very good. I think Joe has done a good follow up of explaining it. I think Mr. Lombardo did a great job. So overall, I think it's a, a, a feasible design. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned with, well, I'm not concerned, but uh, on page 10 of the report, we were supposed to get some Suffolk County Health Department documents. Have we received them? They said by 1229, we would get them. Uh, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, Mr. John. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with those documents. Uh just off the top of my head, but I, I can I can reference those and, and get back to you. Yeah, they were on page 10 of the report they requested me. The other thing was uh, in table 4.4-1, there are several question marks in the columns that have not been filled in. Have they been filled in yet? Which table is this? 4-1. Can you share it, Joe? It's about the basement uh, bathrooms and stuff like that, I think. Oh, I see. Uh, th those have not been uh, finalized yet, but uh, at that point, we, we would leave those uh, types of, you know, due diligence on bathroom layouts and whatnot for the, for the specific design component, you know, the design task of the system. Uh, the other item I was thinking about, in the report, it says, I think we're down like 40 feet to the water table in this area. And it would take 25 to 50 years for any uh, septics to get down to that area. Uh, so really, I guess we're looking at in the center of town, nitrogen level, nitrate levels rather, from, I don't know, 1945, 1950 or something that is finally getting down to the water table that we're sampling. I was just wondering, uh, is, is that a, a realistic number that I'm thinking about? Because we had the, uh, as you know, uh, the um, funeral home right there. And I was wondering how that waste would affect us, may, maybe get down there in 30 years from now. Uh, are we going to be able to have a, a nitrate level that is drinkable within 40 years if we do this? Or are we just, I'm not belittling the, I, I look forward for 40 years that it goes good levels, but you know, I, I, I just was wondering, are we hitting the problem that we really have? 
I, um, I, I'm not familiar with that, that uh, figure that you shared about, you know, 40 years for the contributions to hit the, the hit the aquifer. I, I think that's possible in some circumstances, but generally we would see, uh, you know, recharge contributions hitting the aquifer m much faster than that based on our soil conditions. I think the numbers, the figures that we have shared are um, groundwater flow travel times. So how long it would take for, um, you know, uh, that uh, water in that area to make its way out of the aquifer is, is on a scale of, you know, 25 to 100 years in some places. Um, Joe, when you say out of the aquifer, you mean out to the, uh, to the surrounding uh, bodies of water? That's right. Yeah, all, all water and, you know, all, all water in our aquifer ultimately heads downhill and that's to uh, and out of and out of the island and that's into the, the surrounding water bodies. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really a matter of how long it takes for the water to get there. And that's a natural that's a natural flow, you know, and that, that's, that's a good thing. You know, some sometimes we uh, we're worried about, um, you know, losing the, the water. We feel like we're supposed to uh, you know, that, that makes it unusable, but that natural flow or, or natural, you know, breathing or bleeding of the aquifer out is what helps uh, flush the aquifer. So as rain falls on the island, it's pushing out uh, the pollutants that we contribute and ultimately they go into our, you know, into our estuary. So, you know, we have to be mindful of what we're contributing in that regard, but, uh, but that flow is what's important. Otherwise it becomes just a stagnant aquifer and everything you put there stays there forever. So we're we're lucky in a sense that there's movement, and what we contribute uh, to it can you know can eventually be be pushed out. Some areas it just takes much much longer than others. Uh, now, with respect to your question about you know will, will this particular project uh, make our nitrogen levels below the the New York State and EPA standards? That's a very very difficult question to answer. Uh, the problem, you know, about excess nitrogen in the center area and other parts of the island um, is, is far more widespread uh, than just the municipal buildings. You know, we have identified uh, some of the largest single point contributors uh, because of their scale and their use, like the school or uh, town hall, uh, where people are, you know, generally congregate and, and have used historically for a long time. Uh, but but there are just the buildings that fall within the realm of what we can do to, to address. There are many other residential homes that are in this same area that have antiquated, un, you know, relatively untreated septic systems. So I would say that this system uh, single-handedly collects the biggest contributors in this particular area. Uh, mm -hmm. But this project really should be viewed as one part of uh, what we've talked about in the past as a, as a comprehensive uh, plan and strategy to improving the health of our aquifer and, and, and increasing the sustainability. Uh, there will be many other uh, aspects of restoring the aquifer to, to a more sustainable state. And, and that extends to projects like our residential IA systems and, uh, and, and understanding you know, how, how we can make an uh, impact on a smaller individual scale. Um, I would hope that we would see in a relatively short order, some decrease in the nitrogen levels, particularly in the immediate areas of those buildings, because we would effectively be stopping their contribution. Uh, so we would we would expect that there would be some decrease, uh, but it's it's far too difficult to put a precise uh, number on how much and, and and when that would be. Okay, so we still have a lot of work to do to get the area and or the residents in that area safe drinking water. That's right. Okay, so this is not a solution for the drinking water. It's part of the time, solution. It's, time, it's part of the solution. Part okay. of the solution. It's an important part. It's the, yes, it's the really. biggest contributors. You know, uh, when we're looking at um, how much these particular buildings are contributing, I mean, we're talking about a treatment site on the scale of, you know, eight to 10,000 gallons per day. That's, that's the equivalent of, of quite a few homes. Uh, so in one, in one shot, you know, we're, we're able to pick up a pretty substantial uh, proportion of of our you know of our high high nitrogen contributing facilities. Yeah, but you're also it's 150 milligrams per liter, which is a very high concentration. It's also a very high concentration. Yeah, so that's sort of the double whammy is that it's high flow and high concentration. So uh, if we were to equate it to a residential home, 
you know, it's not just how many, it's not just dividing the gallons. It's also understanding that this is the, the more concentrated uh, contribution. So it, it's even more effective in that regard. Thank you, Jim. Peter Grand. Peter's the chairman of the uh, Water Advisory Council. Yeah, you're on mute, Pete. I'm trying. There we go. There we go. Uh, I assume you can, you can hear me now. Uh, so this conversation is excellent. And uh, Joe is doing such a great job. And all of you, I think the questions, Howard, those are really, really spot on questions. Uh, so I don't know that me speaking at length is relevant here. I did share a little bit of uh, information with BJ and Meg at the last WAC meeting. And um, so I just wanted to add, the, so the report contains an older version of the United States Geological Survey solute transport modeling. Um, which was updated very, very, and published very, very recently in a final form. Um, and uh, what that actually shows as we zoom in closely to the 114 corridor between the IGA and the school um, is even more extreme uh, travel, uh, curvature of the travel time um, to the saltwater interface. Uh, more along the lines of that zone uh, will retain uh, waste that we put into it for 200 to 500 years. That may be an overestimate or extreme. It's just a mathematical model that we're looking at here. Um, but the, inf it, the information that we're getting, if anything, the scientific information that we're getting, if anything, um, is uh, making it even more urgent that we focus on uh, wherever we place our waste, not putting it along that high ridge between that Joe ably pointed out. Uh, between all the watersheds. Um, even moving a little off center, the curvature is so fast, even moving a little off center uh, in terms of waste discharge uh, would have an enormous impact on potentially on the order of centuries. Um, on the other hand, uh, Howard's uh, right, correct pessimism uh, gets a little bit reinforced there. We are going to be living with what we've done already. And we are going to be living with that for a very long time. So absolutely, this is not the uh, be all and end all solution. There are many, many more, more things that we have to do. Um, Meg brought up something at the last meeting, town board meeting on this topic, um, uh, which was uh, just asking the question, if we're removing water, is there any component to this project that involves water capture? Um, and uh, Pio's response to that question, Mr. Lombardo's re response to that question uh, um, was that the amount of water being drained away is minimal um, and won't have a real, we won't really be draining out our aquifer. Um, but I will point out that when we take a look at the island center as being the place where the, we have the longest travel times, where waste stays with us, for the longest amount of time. Whereas what we're essentially saying is that that's the beginning of the river and the end of the river is at the salt, is at the edges of uh, the island. Uh, and there is actually a place slightly before the beginning of that river and that's the rainfall. And there's where we have water that is actually free of nitrogen. Well, not, there's plenty of nitrogen in the air, but it, the cleanest possible water is the water that's raining from the sky. So when we capture that water, uh, whether we use it to recharge the aquifer or use it to, uh, in some fashion along with our water supply efforts, uh, perhaps for dilution of our, uh, or purification or adding pure water to our um, uh, water resources that we'll be distributing in terms of water supply, uh, that fresh water um, is, uh, really a, our most critical resource. So among the many, many, many projects that we'll have to follow the, this project, um, assuming we go forward, um, water capture is going to be critical. Um, that it, as Joe pointed out, it's how we will accomplish the flushing. It's the other end of accomplishing the flushing. The one end is the draining out, but the other end is what you put in. Um, so uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And I think that this project, I don't, think makes any sense if it's not seen um, as part of a larger commitment to managing the whole whole resource cycle that we have here. Any other committee members? Penny, I've, uh, 
Oh yeah, you're on the uh, green option. Yep, you have to unmute yourself. Um, I but I'm happy. Yeah, you can hear me. Yep. Okay. Um. Well, first of all, I've been provoked by many things I've heard and had many questions and many, you know, ideas from what everyone has said. So it's sort of hard to, you know, uh, focus down on any anything specifically, but I will just go off my notes. And I did read the proposal completely. Uh, and I've also looked at John Cronin's um, report that he gave the town in 2019 uh, where an intern had also sampled wells and that's sort of generated some of this concern because of nitrate levels. And uh, I looked at their graphics, which I found very interesting. And one of them was, uh, first of all, in the, in the Lombardi proposal, uh, I saw nothing specific about wells, like uh, each individual area you're talking about hooking into the system, how much nitrate, nit how many, what the nitrates milligrams per liter were in each one of your buildings. So I'd like to know that. Um, the only thing that I did uh, see based on John Cronin's uh, report was that the school was over the 10 milligrams per liter level, which is the acceptable level from Suffolk County. And there was a graphic that showed uh, where the most concentrated nitrogen is appearing in the center. And I wish I could put it up, uh, uh, you know, I know you have it in your files, but it looked like Duval Road was highly concentrated, Midway Road from Smith Street all the way to at least Bowditch uh, along that whole, all the wells sampled along there. And, Sunshine, heading down t towards uh, you know in Fresh Pond area, and so uh, to me the thing that and I know this from having lived here for many years, the night the school seems to be the center, the central nitrogen um, source, nitrate source, uh, and it looks I mean it looks to me like it's going out in a multiple directions away from the school. Uh, not in any one particular direction. And you can also see other, by color coding, you know, various parts have 4%, 2%, 5%. And it looked to me like uh, along 114, they were around 4 or 5%. And his, he graphed it, their statistics graphed it that over time they saw this developing into a problem that it would reach a point where it was no longer drinkable. But right now, all of your, based on what I've, all the information I have, is that your water is still usable. The school is the one that isn't. And so my question is, how, what is the real need? Because they even use the word sufficient. He said, right now, they are sufficient and in, his, uh, in his report. So that's question number one. I really would like information on nitrogen levels in all of these buildings. Um, uh, also, um, I'm quite concerned about the whole concept as, a, as, a, as an environmentally sensitive issue of moving any water into an area that is sensitive. And I see uh, the Lily Pond Mill Pond complex, which is very close to this uh, proposed area and all of the wetlands that go beyond it, which includes my land, by the way. Uh, and uh, I'm very concerned about how that, which direction that water is going to go to find deeper water or as you, and the thing that concerns me the most is thinking of open water as a, a final dumping place, like whether the way this all proposed is that it will reach this pond or it will reach the harbor or it will reach wherever. And it's like, and, and it's no longer our issue. It's no longer our problem. And to me, it is our problem. If we're, if we're going to have this going into Cockles Harbor, 
Cockles Harbor is a, a prolific uh, marine life generator and putting this nitrogen there, I know it already does go there anyway, but putting more of it, concentrating it and bringing it down very close to it and letting it go into the harbor, it really concerns me. There are saltwater marshes close to this area and there are freshwater wetlands right surrounding this kind of, this, this airfield. So that is a big concern of mine. Um, that and also I, I really question that land was sold to the town by the landowners thinking that it was protected, that it would be part of their family legacy to leave an open space that was uh, by Cronin's statistics looks like it was pretty pristine as far as water and nitrates, that it's less than 1%. So to bring in more and, and, and to, is, uh, it makes me wonder who's going to want to sell their 2% land to the 2% committee if they don't know what the ultimate long-term use of it will be. If it's going to then all of a sudden turn into a sewage treatment area after you think that you've protected it and it's there to recharge, it's recharging our aquifer right now, only it's clean, it's far cleaner. So those are all issues that I have personally, as a green uh, committee member and as a resident, um, I have lots of other questions, but I will stop it for now. And I look forward to getting uh, into more of these issues. Um, one other thing, this is having lived in this area for this particular part of Shelter Island for 20 years, 10 years, 11 years ago, we were begging the town board to pump us out because we had a severe flood event based on a cat catastrophic rainfall and snow melt that year. And what all this whole series of ponds that I'm sort of living in the middle of turn into about a 10 acre lake. So I am quite concerned that this Right now, it looks like it's going to go off into Cockles Harbor or wherever they think it's going to go, although it looks to me like it might go into another freshwater wetlands. Um, what is going to happen to that? Is it just going to sit in this great big puddle that we were all sitting in for three months until we got the only way? We, it, and it didn't go anywhere. It just sat here. It had to be pumped out. The town had to get the county here and they pumped it into North South Ferry. So, it's sort of ironic to me that 10, 11 years ago, I'm asking the town to pump me out. And now I'm sitting here quite concerned about you pumping, proposed pumping thousands of gallons of nitrogen laden and water here. It really concerns me. So, uh, and everyone's drinking water, et cetera, in this area, there are people that live here. So enough said. Thanks, Penny. Amber, are you watching both screens? I can't see you. Uh... Anybody else want to speak? Committees? Gordon, Gordon, Gordon's waving his hand. Gordon Gooding's chairman of the uh, CPF. Good afternoon. Um... I don't know whether I can stay within the three minutes, but I will work like hell to get it together, okay? Um, I, when I was listening to this presentation, it was one thing that sort of Meg brought out to light and I looked at this thing and I, 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 I don't know the relationship of Lombardi with this, uh, this system. It, it seems like they are, there seems to be some, appears to be some conflict and I'm not sure about that, okay? And so rather than me saying that, I'd like to know what that relationship is. And as a consultant, I would think that the consultant would provide other, they're not the installer, they're recommending the systems. And I would think we would wanna have something more on a generic so that we can go out for competitive bid on, if you did this thing did occur, that you would wanna have 
alternate systems or alternate contracts rather than being deal, dealing with one particular system. It seemed odd, okay, and, uh, but I think that was a good question that was brought up. Uh, I'm gonna try to be brief, okay. Uh, obviously, my issue is that as a chair of community preservation, um, you know, I'm following a long list of people who have, have been involved when preservation first started. They, you know, with the, it was a, a good program, okay, and um, a lot of lands were protected. This particular land, okay, was protected in, in, back in 2005. It was a joint ownership with uh, Suffolk County. And at that time, the property, just to give some people some background with it, uh, it's not done this way currently, but when at that time, the land was divided between Suffolk County and uh, uh, the town of Shelter Island. Now, today, today all properties are, are joint ownership, okay? So it, it's not splitting land, okay? So over on the airfield, the airfield belongs to us just to the west. That's all Suffolk County property. Um, I, I guess what I did is I looked at the stewardship plan. I was looking at, you know, what the thinking was at the time when properties were preserved, okay? And just to get, looking at the stewardship, I was just looking at some of these things. I quote, the acquisition for open space was possible by eliminating the possibility of 25 homes, meaning we're eliminating 25 septic systems, uh, 25 more straws drawing from the water. The primary objectives to preserving the the primary objective was to preserve the underlying water table and to protect it from contaminants. Uh, the border, the, the, and this is in the stewardship plan. Everyone is welcome to look at it. Uh, the, the property borders on Lily Pond to the south, with a part of, with a series of wetlands running north to south. Uh, in it, in this stewardship plan, it says the open this open space will protect the integrity of the pond. Now we have two ponds, Lily Pond, and there's one to the north, okay, which is part of the Quaker, uh, Quaker, what was originally the Quaker uh, property, okay. Um, the other quote is the wetlands, the pond is, <clears throat> had to deal with wetlands, the pond is ecologically valuable freshwater wetlands, home to snapping turtles, ducks, and so forth. So we have some language in here, which was created at the time the property was acquired that was really for um, re recharge, not recharge, it was for protection of the property, less development, less density. And, um, um, you know, so I just suggest everyone take a look at it, okay, if this proceeds further. Um, this proposal, this proposed usage of CPF property for leaching fields will be the first on Shelter Island on community preservation land. And to my best of my knowledge, after searching out the five East End towns, I don't know of another preserve where there are leaching fields on preserved property. Uh, I've contacted Suffolk County. I don't have any, there was nobody who could give me an answer. And to the best of their knowledge, that was not in existence. So really, I guess my question is, and this is what begs the question, okay, what property would be next for different types of usage, okay? Um, are we opening up a Pandora's box for other usage of CPF properties going forward? Uh, and I guess my point is that, you know, we're in the middle of the winter, these things are, you know, we're discussing things that, you know, we have 2,500 year round residents, okay? Uh, we have other people who are owners of property here who are not present. They may not be here on the island. And I, I guess, you know, the, the question is, um, do the, you know, we do these things in the middle of the winter. I don't know how they have a voice. OK, but besides that, um, are we opening up a Pandora's box for using property going forward? And I guess the thing that I would encourage, and I don't think anybody on the board, town board would object to this, okay? Um, I would ask the town residents to speak out about, speak out and be heard about how we're using community preservation properties, okay? Currently, we have no structures on buildings. They're basically passive uh, protection and basically for walking, 
for recharge. So they all have stewardship plans. And I think it is a big issue. And, and I do, I do think, okay, that, um, I think we, I, and I acknowledge the fact and I know we have a problem in the center. Okay. Um, I, I just would like us to slow down a little bit and maybe look at, make sure we're looking at all the other alternatives and we carefully look at it. I, I am a little bit concerned with the uh, consultant that you've used because I really think, uh, I just didn't like the flavor or the optics of how that that the company was operating. I know every time I looked at this system, Nitrex it always seemed to come up with uh, Lombardi and it's not no disrespect to him, but I think I like generic specs because this way you spell out a criteria and then someone can quote on it and you get different points of view. So I, I, I think uh, Joe Fenora, you mentioned that there are other proposals. Well, I, this is the only proposal and there are multiple facts factors within that proposal. So I, I would just, I, I would like to see some other proposals from some other people, because this almost sounds, it seems too uh, proprietary. I thank everybody for your time. Joe, I, I don't know if you want to speak on uh, generic uh, proposals, but I mean, we, we had uh, funding to do a study and the study wasn't open to five uh, different consultants. It was open to one consultant. So I don't know, Joe, you wanna to speak to that? Sure, so um, uh, Gordon, there was, there was quite a bit to unpack there, but let me, let me do my best. Uh, and, and some of them, some of those concerns certainly fall um, you know, outside the purview of the, of the engineering department, but I'll, I'll start at the top with the uh, concerns about the proprietary technology. Um, the first is that, um, while Lombardo Associates developed the Nitrex technology, um, it's proprietary in the sense that they designed it uh, and they therefore guarantee the performance. Uh, but it's not um, uh, it's 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 not a conflict in the sense that there's any uh, formal or informal compensation in the form of a royalty or ongoing maintenance contracts for using the technology. Um, this type of system or, or all these types of waste treatment systems uh, are not necessarily off the shelf type components where you can uh, write a performance specification and then go to the sewage treatment store and pick out your system from any one of you know, dozens of providers. Uh, the, the treatment mechanisms and the treatment schemes are proprietary just like any other structural engineer would design an independent structure. Uh, and so it's not the kind of system that um, it has necessarily compatible or, or equal, um, equal competitors. So um, I don't think that's a fair assessment. And we've spoken to Lombardo Associates uh, on many occasions. Once was uh, during the initial uh, presentation about understanding the relationship between his company and the technology. And so uh, knowing that there's no financial incentive or ongoing financial incentive uh, for implementing the system, uh, we don't feel that there is any conflict. And furthermore, uh, the benefit to the town with any of these uh, in-house design systems is that um, it's guaranteed for performance by uh, the designer. So similar to how a professional engineer would guarantee you that uh, the building he erects on your property won't fall down. Uh, the designer of a sewage treatment system guarantees the performance uh, which, which they have agreed to, uh, to meet. So uh, in that regard, uh, I hope that addresses your concerns about the technology. Um, the other aspect uh, that I would add is that uh, the system is adaptable. The Nitrex technology is for the nitrogen reduction, but there are other uh, generic technologies that are used for additional treatment. For instance, UV technology can be implemented to reduce bacteria counts and even some uh, PFO and PFOAs. And so a lot of the treatment uh, process is yet to be, is yet to be implemented and determined. Uh, that will all take place during the design uh, task. The, uh, the other concerns that you mentioned about uh, wetlands and impacts to adjacent ponds uh, one of the major advantages to the airfield is that um, all of those uh, residential neighborhoods, uh, with few exceptions, and the ponds 
at this stage are considered to be upgradient of the groundwater flow. So um, in fact, what's happening in the ponds would be impacting what's uh, in the ground at the airfield. Um, does that make sense? The ponds are, are uphill, so to speak, of any siting of a, of a treatment or recharge facility. So we wouldn't expect anything we contribute to the ground at the airfield to go into the ponds, but the opposite. What's happening in the ponds, what we, what we put into the ponds would travel through the ground in the area of the, of the treatment facility. Um, the, other, the other item that, that you discussed, and, and I'll, I'll walk sensitively around this because it's not within my purview, is about CPF usage. Um, you know, I, I, I heard you mention the idea that this particular parcel and, and many other parcels are, are designated for preservation because of their ability to uh, prevent 25 new straws from going in the ground, uh, prevent 25 new septic systems from going in the ground. What's unique about this project is that it's it's designed to service municipal buildings, and so presumably those are pollution contributions made by the made by the the residents, the taxpayers, people visiting town hall, the children attending the school, and so conceptually, I think it's a fair connection to make that we're using this or proposing to use a community preservation funded parcel to to help. Uh, preserve that same community. That the, the municipal contributions are are those that are going to be negated or remediated by this particular type of project. So, um, in terms of aquifer protection and preventing 25 straws going in the ground, this treatment facility is not uh, a compromise for a new development, which is often the case in uh, our adjacent communities on the north and south forks. One of the very common consolation prizes for community development, whether it be new condos or a new housing uh, cul-de-sac, is that they put in one of these treatment plants to help offset the impact of the new development. This particular treatment plant is put in to offset the impact of existing uh, users and existing buildings and those that are wholly owned by uh, the municipality. So, you know, conceptually, this is a bit unique, certainly compared to anything that we've seen in uh, similar communities and that we are using this project to help reduce our impact as a community uh, by using community parcels. Now, I don't by any means uh, uh, try to tout that as some sort of a you know, legal uh, certainty and, and that's the part where I'd have to hand this off. But I think it's important for the public to know the, the general uh, good faith effort that's behind this and the, and the positive impact that we can have on, uh, on a shared resource. You know, I, I, I said this once before, perhaps in a, in a WAC meeting, but um, this particular project uh, certainly uh, is the, has the potential to have the greatest impact on water quality improvement than we've considered to date. And it's closer than ever. We actually have this project funded so that we can have the design drawings handed to us, uh, you know, in, in a couple of months. And uh, we've not, certainly not during my tenure, and as far as I know, during John Crohn's, we've not had a project of, of similar potential and scale to do so much good uh, for our community. Water quality improvement has been something that has been, it, it's discussed on a, on a weekly basis at town board work sessions. It's discussed in all of the town board member campaigns that I hear. It's, there's, countless committees that are working to address these issues. This is the first opportunity we have to make a real, real difference on how our municipality uh, is contributing to our, to our nitrogen problem. So I would encourage all those members of the community to continue to follow the updates on these reports. The report that's posted on the website now was the, was the initial draft report. We've since had an update that I'm, I'm nearly finished reviewing which considers a lot of these other questions that I've heard today, namely uh, flood concerns. Uh, one of the subsequent analysis that we had done uh, from the first presentation was to understand what are the impacts of uh, sea level rise? What are the impacts on um, high severity rainfalls uh, because of what we've known to be, known to have had some, some flood events. Um, par portions and large portions of the airfield have turned out to be uh, satisfactory for this type of use when we consider as much as a six foot sea level rise to climate change, as well as a 500 year flood occurrence. So those two events in combination, which I, you know, I, 
I think most people would say is a is almost apocalyptic uh, that you'd see those two criteria happening at the same time would still uh, allow this system to function as designed. So we're looking very much in the long term uh, for both the infrastructure on this and the and the impact. And um, I'd encourage everyone to continue to you know uh, stay up to date with these reports. And and I think this conversation has been great. I'll have the uh, I'll have the updated report available. Uh, on the town website by the by the end of the week, and those studies will be included, uh, so so uh, everyone can have a better understanding of what I'm referencing in terms of uh, flood levels and, and sea level rise um, as well. Good, thanks, Joe. Jim Colligan. Yeah, Joe. Uh, when we put this project out to bid, how many bids did you receive? Uh, three. Okay. What was the process of selecting Lombardo? So uh, the town procurement procedures um, are, are, are also pu publicly available, but uh, the bids are reviewed both from a, a cost perspective, uh, but not exclusively. For professional services, we're not obligated to, to pick the low bid. Labardo Associates happen to be the low bid, uh, but in reviewing their qualifications, they've got extensive experience in, in this type of project design, uh, and we felt that they were well qualified to, to take on this project. Okay. My, my second comment, uh, Mr. Supervisor, is Peter Grant's comment about it needs to be part of a larger plan. <clears throat> Peter, it's a beginning. It's, it's, it's a crucial beginning. It's the most significant step we can take as a town board to clear up the water issues here in the center of town. So to think that we are going to wait to amass a gigantic plan that's gonna cover all of the problems that we have with our water, both in our near shore areas and in the center of town is not gonna happen. No, I'm completely in agreement. But, but, but I, I, I think, and I think the town, this town board of which I'm one of five have prioritized this project as being the single most important initiative that has occurred on Shelter Island in decades that addresses water issues and the nitrogen issues here in the center of town. Jim, so, you have my amen. <laughs> um, if I could, uh, Jerry? Yep, go ahead, BJ. Thank you. Um, I just I just wanna point out that um, Gordon's um, uh, objection to the season uh, that we're discussing this, I think is maybe just a little less relevant these days. Uh, here we are on Zoom. I think there's somebody here from San Francisco. So I think that we're off season, not so, if people want to tune in and want to be, you know, active members of this discussion, it was pretty much open and, and available. So I just want to sort of bat that one away. Okay. Anybody else? Andrew, yes. you're watching the second screen, right? Penny, I just want to see if anybody has to speak uh, the first time around first. John uh, Kat, Kathleen Gooding. Yep. I just, I just also want to repeat, I, I think, you know, we just did this uh, at the Historical Society, this wonderful event over the preserved lands. And many, many of the lands, you have many, many people out there that really are appreciating um, the use and the beauty and what we've done on the island to keep open space properly. And I, I have concerns about using preserved land when we've made a commitment not only to the not only to the owners that you've purchased the land from, but also to the community that this this land is pure and this land is clean, and this land is going to re, you know recharge and everything it was supposed to do. It's a commitment that a prior town board made to the community, and I don't know what kind of a precedent it sets when you decide to go in a different direction when you decide that, well, we don't really want to keep this land clean and pure anymore. We want to, you know, use it as a, as a waste management property. I, have, I don't think that's a good uh, way of representing uh, your commitment to the community when you do something. So if something's been said, I believe that should stay on. And uh, I think the project itself is great. I, I, I think we need to do this project. I think the whole thing that you're talking about is great. I just think that it's a, a different issue that when you're made, or you've made one commitment to the community about preserving this land, 
and maintaining it for water recharge and clear open space, that then you're going to go back and use it for a different purpose. Yeah, I just thanks, think Kat. that that's not a okay. good representation for the community. I, I was going to hold off on my comments, but now that's twice, so I'll uh, I'll respond to it. Uh, the the main reason for the community preservation fund on Shelter Island and why it was approved by 78% of the uh, voting populace uh, the first time around and the second time around was for aquifer preservation. Everything we do on Shelter Island is based on water because we're a sole source aquifer. And, and aquifer preservation doesn't mean preserving the aquifer over the land we buy. It means preserving the aquifer island wide. And, and if this, this potential project it has, has an effect on the overall aquifer of the island. It's certainly something that should be looked at and addressed. And I, I don't think we're looking to uh, contaminate uh, lands that we're buying by putting up buildings or putting up uh, sewer treatment plants or anything. We're looking to protect the aquifer. That's the big picture. That's what we're looking to do. So I, I think, and, and there, there are methods to do it. Gordon, uh, I, ha I have a, a, uh, cited a, a number of uh, uh, sites that the state legislative le legislature approved for making plot land into sewage treatment land. I also have uh, sightings of uh, how uh, CPF was done uh, by changing the management plan to include uh, recharge of, of the uh, island overall as opposed to the specific uh, Lot, and that's something you know we'll get into as these discussions continue. Jim Colligan. Yeah, I just want to use a couple of illustrations. And Jerry, that was a great segue for me. We're one island. We're all in this thing together. All eight thousand plus you know acres of it. I happen to be, and a lot of you have been associated with Mashamak. Shamak occupies about 26% of the landmass of Shelter Island, uh, 2,039 acres to be exact. Penny Kerr, you, you, you cited a thing that happened 11 years ago when we had 10 and a half inches of rain over just over a 24 hour period. And it was the worst flooding that the island's probably ever seen in centuries. In fact, the flooding didn't really show its full self until about three or four days after the event, when it had stopped raining. The water just kept coming and getting deeper and flooded out a lot of those homes. We had an opportunity there, I remember as a community, to rather than take all this fresh water and put it into the bays, is to recharge in Mishamak. And we had, and I was on the board of trustees at Mishamak. We talked about what benefit we would have in terms of taking that water, which was in close proximity to the Mishamak boundaries, and be able to recharge certain areas of Mishamak. We argued back and forth for hours about what it was going to do in the springtime to, you know, to wildlife. On the main, but what ended up happening is we ended up pumping millions and millions and millions of gallons of water back into the bays. A lost opportunity, I thought. You've got to weigh the good with the bad to, to dump millions of gallons of fresh water into the into salt water makes no sense to me. The other thing was the power line. We, we the taxpayers spent nine, ten million dollars to run a power line from Greenport over to the Shelter Island. It failed. We then got a second attempt at doing it. In between, we talked about placing a power station. I was at the meeting on a Saturday morning and said, listen, with 2,039 acres, we could carve out, all they're looking for is about one acre of land with this power station off of Route 114 in close proximity to 114. And I was praised for thinking outside the box and then chastised because somebody in, who will remain nameless in a very high position at, at Mishamak uh, on that board said, oh good, then I wanna buy an acre also with two acres. We had an opportunity there to, to think, even entertain. I don't say that it had to go there, but we never even seriously considered it. Why? Because we're all out for our own little piece of the action. I think as a town board member, one of the things we get elected for 
is to look at the, the good of the entire island. And you have to weigh these things. So there, there is a lot of give and take. Um, I live in Silver Beach. This is, you know, this is, our, our problem is different from the problem here in the center of the island. But it, it's something that I, I love these comments. I think a lot of them are legitimate. I think Joe benefits from hearing from them. So does so do the town board members. But I would like to urge everybody to say that we do, the only way we're gonna solve these problems is, is a little bit of give and take, you know, in terms of um, making decisions on what's gonna benefit the island and the people that reside here for decades to come. Thank you. Okay, John Carter, I see your, your hand up. You have to unmute yes, yourself. Yes, thank John. you. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I asked a question of Jerry at the last uh, board meeting concerning uh, the actual uh, toxicity of the effluent coming out of this nitrex system. Right. And uh, he said he passed it on to you. And I've done a lot of research on this. I can't find data anywhere about what is that effluent, kind of, kind of, what's in it. Uh, the pharmaceuticals, I assume, would still be in it because this system we're getting is not going to include that. I assume it's also going to include the PFOs. Uh, I imagine it'll include the bacteria and viruses, whatever is coming flushed down, all is being washed out. I need to see exact data what comes out of that, if we're gonna be dumping that into our environment. So that's my first question. The second question relates to the concept here. When you pump from a well, you can create a cone of depression, which means you're sucking water from a whole area around that in a cone shape as it goes down. When you do that, you end up making the soils collapse. It's called subsidence. And the more pumping you do, the more it will subside. And when we have subsidence, we destroy foundations, we, do, we break plumbing, we do a lot of serious problems underground. By taking this water, this is potentially 2 million gallons and pumping it through the airfield, you're taking that water which helped counteract subsidence. So all those wells that are constantly sucking will have more water coming back into them. So that water really should not be recharged down at a low position, it should be recharged at a high position on the island. When you put that water up there, it will contribute to the flushing of the center to allow the center to be able to recharge itself. If you're putting only 2% nitrates, nitrogen in, nitrates into the water there, it will then have a chance to flush out, dilute whatever's being produced in that area, and then can percolate down to the different watersheds to wherever it's going to go. That makes sense. That is, that's scientific information. It's not pumping stuff in places where it doesn't belong and where you're gonna pollute things that don't need to be polluted. Thank you. Joe. Sure. Um, uh, addressing your, your first point, John, um, in terms of the, the output, um, Largely, that's influenced by what the input is, uh, which we which we don't have a full understanding of yet. Uh, so, uh, the system would be uh, modified or adapted or designed at this stage uh, to include removal of those contaminants that uh, that that would be present that would be intended to be removed. So, for instance, uh, if PFOAs are in the flow stream at a level above what's uh, allowed, then treatment for PFOAs would be included. If uh, pharmaceuticals were uh, in the flow uh, above a limit that we would deem acceptable, then we would include treatment of, uh, of, of pharmaceuticals. Uh, overwhelmingly, and I won't say for every case, but overwhelmingly sewage treatment uh, is required to have disinfection. There's a number of mechanisms for how you do that, uh, but the sewage treatment on a, on a commercial scale or combined scale almost always includes uh, disinfection. So um, your request for uh, you know, specific effluent characteristics is, is somewhat um, difficult to provide at this stage, uh, but know that one of the primary advantages to the system is that we can uh, have the option to treating as we need uh, to eliminate those types of things. Your other points about uh, subsidence and well draw, 
uh, you know, well heard. Uh, uh, I would disagree with you respectfully on the the technical uh, principles behind you know some of those concerns. The the well extraction rates and the septic contribution rates. Um, you know, I, I I think that's quite inaccurate. That uh, you know, relocating this would cause some sort of foundational subsidence. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure there's any uh, legitimacy to that to that concern, particularly in this case. But um, you know, for the interest of discussing these technical items in more detail with you, I'm, I'm happy to uh, you know arrange a time to to uh, you know have have you express those concerns and and address those directly. Thanks, Joe. I, I see the next. Uh, Lenova tab two, if you could just identify yourself, please. Uh, yes, Jerry, that's me, Tom Field. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah, I've got you, Tom. Yeah, that's me. Uh, that's my, my tablet, if you want to make a note of that. Um, uh, on behalf of the Bayman, I just want to say that um, we think that uh, this is a bad placement. The airstrip is a bad placement for a treatment plant. Um, it's, and it's directly because of the proximity to Cockles Harbor. Um, uh, this was very informative. I've gotten a few numbers in the back of my brain here. Apparently it was like three, five or 10 years from the location of this plant to Cockles Harbor versus 50 or 100 years from where the water originated from. So that right there in itself will speed up the process of any contaminants that are missed entering um, you know, this watershed area. Um, that's one reason. Um, and uh, we just were against it because of Cockles Harbor's proximity. Um, and just a note, many of the, the full-time commercial baymen live within that watershed that you plan on, that this treatment plant will be in. Um, so on this, um, yeah, we would definitely know, we would like you to find a different location. Um, it's a great idea, great concept. Um, the other thing, maybe we pull, you know, the proposal maybe sh should incur um, include all these um, other contaminants other than nitrogen. You know, maybe we should look into, um, you know, what the cost is to get these things right off the bat instead of waiting a year or two down the line to figure out that we should have done this. You know, maybe that's something we could think about. Um, a, a lot of good information came from Penny and John. And uh, uh, the other thing that came from, I forgot his name there, but it seems to go against the stewardship plan for the airstrip. I think that should be, you know, really thought about and, and considered in this, um, you know, when this was acquired, when this property was acquired, there was, you know, kind of a specific goal for what was supposed to happen there then and changing that now would also go against that, you know, that stewardship there. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks for the time there. Thanks, Tom. Um, Thanks for jumping in. Oh, uh, okay. one last thing. What if, um, what if uh, you know, this whole process would have happened on town land versus CPF land? Would that make a difference in anything, um, considering stewardship plans and whatnot, you know? Um, that might be something to consider. Right. Um, okay. that's it. Thanks, okay. Tom. Thanks. Kevin? It's Bill Nastro. It's oh, unfortunately I'm sorry. My, son's, my son's Zoom account. Go ahead, um, Joe. Joe, thank you for what I think has been an extremely professional an informative presentation. I have what I think is a relatively simple question. When you, when you decided that the airfield was the best location, how come you chose that over Fisk Field? That would be my only question at this point. Sure. Uh, backing up to one uh, point that, that Tom made uh, with regard to the impact on Cockles Harbor, uh, based on the subwatershed plan, uh, which we had brought up on, on screen a little bit earlier, um, we expect that the net uh, impact to Cockles Harbor based on the airfield site would be a, a net benefit, a net reduction in nitrogen contribution, seeing as the majority of our untreated contributions now in the center do go to Cockles Harbor currently. So uh, when considering that we're looking at a 90 plus percent reduction of nitrogen when, when locating at the airfield or in any of these circumstances, you have 90% reduction in nitrogen wherever we cite it, seeing as it's going to be in the same watershed, uh, we would expect that the overall nitrogen contribution by this project, implementing this project, uh, would, would be significant to Cockles Harbor. So in that respect, uh, whether you cited at the center or you cited at the airfield, 
um, overall nitrogen contribution from the center municipal buildings to Cocos yeah. Harbor will decrease. Uh, so in case there was any concern about that, and, and with regard to nitrogen contribution in totality to Cocos Harbor, you know, the, the impacts of surface applied uh, fertilizers and such from the Ram Islands alone uh, pale uh, the impact of the you know, any any subsurface you know recharge component for, for nitrogen as it as it pertains to to Cocos Harbor. So I think that's an important point to drive home because you know that's, that's an obvious concern is uh, we're, we're locating this closer to Cocos Harbor, but you know we have to have an understanding of what how that how that matches in terms of scale and impact of nitrogen and phosphorus loading. Uh, and then and then back to the current question um, about um, I'm sorry one more time for me. Oh. Uh Oh, Fisk Basically, field, right. Fisk field compared yeah. to the airfield. And just so I understood what you just said, I also took it that from the perspective of the estuaries, the airfield is better for Cockles Harbor than locating it in the center. Is that correct? Uh, well, I would say, yes, that's correct. But I would expand that to say the implementation of the project is better for the estuaries, no matter where it is, because we are not creating any additional waste flows. We are treating to a higher level existing waste flow. So there's no matter where you site this particular project, you're already reducing the nitrogen, you know, phosphorus contributions. Uh, so whether it's at the airfield or in the center, um, you know, that sort of gets back to the good, better, best approach is, you know, and, and that's the ultimately the answer to your Fisk Field question is that right. uh, at, at Fisk Field, you know, we're still over that center area uh, where where groundwater contributions would linger for a very long time. Fisk Field does offer us quite a bit of space, uh, but mm -hmm. it has the downside of the the environmental aspect there that we're we're prioritizing getting out of that center area uh, into a. a a closer, you know, more swiftly moving area of the watershed, but also uh, the the amount of recreation that happens on Fisk Field. We we wouldn't want to long term have any sort of a hamper on what we do with the with the field arrangements or have any impact to uh, the operational capabilities of the of the field. Um, whereas at the airfield, you know, we would we would essentially have no impact to the current operations effectively. You know, remain uh, open space, and with the potential to put this uh, treatment underground, you potentially wouldn't even you wouldn't see anything. It would all be happening subsurface. So at Fisk Field, we were, there was a concern that uh, you know if you wanted to change the field around or you know do something in the future, you'd be bound by uh, how you arrange this plant now. Right. Thank you. It sounds Fisk Field could be viable, but I hear why you chose. Uh, the airfield, but the airfield has the stewardship issues. So Fisk Field could be an alternative is what I'm taking out of this. Yeah, certainly. There are a number yeah. of alternative sites. Uh, and uh, I keep getting back to this good, better, best. And, you know, that's ultimately for the, the town to decide, um, you know, these are long term infrastructure projects. So, you know, we have to really heavily weigh uh, what, what will happen in the future, what our needs will be in the future. Uh, and, and and that's largely you know why why Fisk Field was uh, deemed to be you know less less suitable. Okay, thanks. It Thank is you. in fact you know the stewardship program in many ways uh, becomes sort of an of an advantage because we know that there will be no change of use to that type of, of parcel. Okay, uh, I, I, Penny, I still want to go up the first round. Uh, Wendy, did you have something you wanted to ask? I saw your hand up before. You're good. Okay. Anybody else that hasn't spoken? Jerry, I think Tom Field has a has a follow up. Yeah, Penny Penny uh, also does. Uh, go ahead, Tom. You go first. Uh, yeah, uh, just real quick. I think uh, we know that you really the intention is to take the nitrogen. I think the main worry and concern is what is is not going to be taken out. Like we don't even know what those um, elements are yet. You know, with the mention of fertilizers from. Uh, from Ram Island going in. Well, we don't need, we don't have, there's no plans to take any of that stuff out. So that's what we're worried about, increasing the load in that particular area, I think, because it does eventually and faster enter the, uh, the Cockles Harbor area there. Um, and it's really what is not getting grabbed from this system that I think is, uh, 
what the concern is and and uh, that being dumped in that location we think we think it would be better if it was further away and the time frame was longer before whatever treated effluent actually reached the surface waters yeah a um, hundred years is a lot more than you know three five or ten i think that we got to you know we got to keep this mm -hmm. water within the within our uh, the area rather than put it closer to the surface waters um that's pretty much it thanks okay i see eric clock for the uh, first round eric good to see you a long time no see you. Um, and th thank you everyone first and foremost and, and Joe and, and the whole town here for putting a tremendous amount of effort and thought into this. Um, and I really have a kind of a 30,000 foot question and then maybe one one more in particular, which I think was touched on as well. Um, what, what's been the thought around um, either some right. mitigation no. or reverse osmosis to reduce the amount going in um, within the center? Um, and, and perhaps some kind of subsidy for either residential properties um, <clears throat> or obviously the, the school and town structures to have a system put in that actually reduces the amount um, uh, of, of nitrogen going in. Um, and it seems like that might even be a more effective and, and a quicker time to reduce the actual footprint uh, of, the, of the issue at hand. Um, so that was question number one. And then I think I heard from Tom that the leaching from the um, the site in Klanowickis would be three to 10 years. Um, and then also, I think we all have similar concerns around, um, obviously, I think nitrogen is one thing, but if, if a, uh, a gallon of bleach or a, a gallon of Drano goes down and, and comes into a more local area for all of us, um, I'm obviously an interested homeowner in the area as well. Um, how quickly you said kind of bi-weekly, but how quickly can that be addressed and, and really treated in the in the system as contemplated? Thank you. Joe. So the, the, the system receives uh, service by an operator on the frequency which we discussed before, uh, you know, twice a week, uh, several times a month. That's yet to be worked out, but the system is uh, remotely monitored 24-7. Uh, so in terms of functionality, uh, there's a real time review of what's what's going on in terms of performance and obviously if there's a need to dispatch for uh, some sort of a malfunction you know that happens right away uh, i'm not quite sure i understand your your earlier question about reverse osmosis or uh, treating at the school if, if you could clarify that a little bit more um, sure. Yeah, really just curious if there's another way to really stop the the amount going in um, instead of mitigating and, and dealing with what what's really coming out. Um, meaning that is there a way to reduce the amount that's coming from um, the structures and, and the inhabitants of those structures um, that goes back into the local aquifer instead of uh, piping it down to the airfield. And then also with respect to kind of total cost to the project. Um, sure. So if I, I'm still not sure I understand completely, but I'll, I'm going to take a stab at it. Um, you know, the other option as opposed to a centralized treatment is individual uh, treatment sites or facilities or, um, you know, mechanisms for particular uh, parcels. And um, uh, from a cost perspective, uh, those are, those are, are, are way less attractive. Uh, just as a sense of scale, the, the school uh, prior to this project commencing was engaged in a, an IA development program for, for just their facilities. Um, <clears throat> that's a significantly lower capability system in terms of removing pollutants. It's, it's very well suited for uh, you know, nitrogen removals, but would lack the ability to address uh, you know, f future contamination issues or uh, emerging contaminants like we're talking about now, plastic derivatives or uh, pharmaceuticals. And in, in any case, the individual system for the school uh, was budgeted at about $900,000 uh, independently. And so, you know, for, for a reference, you know, we're looking at uh, a little under $4 million for this combined system. Uh, the school would represent a very, the, the most expensive of all the other facilities on the on the, the list now. So we wouldn't expect that uh, you know you'd have six or seven different million dollar systems, but 
there would certainly be many others on a scale of several hundred thousand if we were to do them individually. Uh, but the biggest problem with most of those cases is that a lot of those systems uh, are considered non-conforming. So the current systems now are generally cesspools or septic systems. No, none of those buildings have any sort of uh, more advanced treatment. And uh, because they're non-conforming, many of them also uh, don't meet existing Suffolk County setback requirements. There are uh, multiple instances amongst those municipal buildings where the existing cesspool uh, is too close to an adjacent private well or well for the building. So if we were to reinstall individual systems, we would be faced with uh, a, a slew of variances that we'd have to overcome because the existing systems don't meet standards, uh, didn't meet standards then and, and certainly don't meet standards now. So individual on-site uh, on parcel systems are really considered to be too costly and impractical, both from performance and uh, compliance, you know, reg regulatory standpoints. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and really, I was actually asking, um, that's super helpful, but with respect to the water that they're drinking at the school and, and at some of the residences in the center, could the town potentially subsidize a reverse osmosis system for- Oh, certainly, the, the yeah, yeah, certainly, consumer. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that you're, we're, we're talking about on the other side of the, uh, of this, of the- uh, Exactly. Yeah, so uh, th that's, that's totally, I mean, we've, we've already gone down that road. Uh, there are a number of facilities that have treatment on site. Uh, it gets incredibly complicated when you're talking about public uh, and municipal buildings because, um, putting in a water treatment system at a school is essentially like creating a small public water system. So they become costly in the sense that you have to meet uh, higher standards than you would for just a residential uh, residential use. And you also have the burden of additional professional oversight to run the system. So paying operators, paying for, you know, for maintenance. And uh, in many cases, uh, it's mandatory. You don't have a choice because the water quality is, is so poor. Uh, but long term, you know, that's uh, that's not an, an effective tactic, certainly from a cost cost end, and, and and that's primarily the reason why they're public water systems. You know, so avoid creating you know ten public water systems. You have one centralized water system that services you know a whole a whole district. Eric, as uh, yeah, as, as Peter Grand and uh, Howard and uh, actually and Jim Colligan mentioned before, I mean this is only one piece of of the puzzle to solve the water issues on Shelter Island. I mean this is you know looking for a long-term fix on the aquifers, but we still have to find something, you know, a quick, quicker fix for, you know, use right now. So it's all, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole big puzzle and this is just one piece of it. Yep. Understood. Yeah. And that, that's it for me and, and greatly appreciate the Thanks. amount of time and effort. Thanks for jumping into it. I'll, I'll yeah. defer to Penny. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Lisa's iPad. If you could identify yourself, please. Huh. Hi, it's Lisa Richland. Um, I live north of the airfield um, and north of Matt's Pond, which is part of that uh, stream of freshwater wetlands that Penny was referring to. Um, can, can somebody tell me what the difference in cost would be to put this treatment facility in Fisk Field? And I'm talking about money costs, not loss of recreational facility for a period of time. Um, it seems to me that putting a, a pipeline from the center all the way down uh, 114 and Manwaring Road and Burns Road to the airfield would be a pretty costly um, experience. Can, can somebody give me an idea of what the difference in cost would be? Yeah, Lisa, I'll, I'll let Joe speak to that, but before that, one of the uh, issues and one of the concerns was, and it's something Tommy Field also brought up, was we want to have the ability to uh, expand this system if we have to for treatment. In other words, the school was looking at a pl uh, plan specifically for nitrates. We look If we looked at something in the center here, we can do it specifically with the area we have to filtrate the nitrates, but we're looking you know, down the road, but now there's PFAS in the water. Is pharmaceuticals in the water. So we're looking that and having it in, in a further spot and not so much based on cost 
it, it gives us the long-term ability to uh, potentially filter out uh, known and unknown uh, things in the future. Joe, you want to speak to the... Uh, Nice. The, the, the pipeline cost or the uh, that infrastructure to to go to the airfield is about uh, five hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars of the of the project. So so removing that, you'd expect to see about that that much of a reduction in cost. Penny. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I'm. I'm listening to the language that people are using, you know, especially our, the, the uh, you know, J uh, Joe and the uh, board, and because I know you're very much for this particular best proposal. And it's like when, when you're speaking of the water that you will be bringing into this f potential fisk field site, you make it sound like it's only, you know, it's, it's, it's okay, it's good, it's benign. It's, I've heard that it would be an improvement over the water that's actually there, uh, which by my estimation, I don't believe that is actually correct. I think that it looked like that was less than 1% or one milligram per gallon of nitrates in that part of the island versus two milligrams. So you actually would be increasing it. And so the, I, uh, as John, my husband, John Kerr said, uh, speaking of recharging it at the source or near the source, which I still think of as the school more than any other building, based on the statistics I have read on John Cronin's report that came out in 2019, the one that is over 10 uh, milligrams per liter is the school and your building, you know, your town hall and I you know I would like statistics but I believe they're all in the four percent to four percent they look like everything going down 114 at the high part the spine that you speak of so when you speak of the water over in the airfield you make it sound like it's a it's a it's a good thing and then uh for some reason if you put it in the center it's going to take 200 years someone said to go down through the aquifer. I did study geology, by the way. I'm not a geologist, but I did take it in college. Um, I know it will move toward the sea, but uh, if you're recharging it with this two milligram per liter water that you've treated in the center, you're putting better water in the center and you will dilute your concentration of nitrogen at the source, which is the school mostly because there are over two, 250 people there every five days a week for 10 months of the year. The Legion, right now, not very busy. Sometimes when bowling's happening, it's, there are more people using it. Uh, you know, the, most of your buildings are not sent, concentrated like the school. So, um, um, and, so that is my concern is that when you speak of this water, it should have the same weight, whether it's being this field or the airfield. It should be equally benign. Um, uh, so that concerns me that there isn't, a, you know, there is a bias I, uh, because the airfield is looked at as a potential expansion. And I've, I was told at the last meeting that I spoke at that when I said that you, Jerry, you told me that you meant that it would get out more contaminants, that it would be expanded to treat more contaminants possibly. That's how the expansion would happen. But today I heard what a four inch pipe versus a five inch pipe. And we, you know, that's a different kind of expansion. That's adding more source, more buildings hooking into the system. That concerns me greatly. I've heard a lot of enthusiasm from people at other meetings talking about adding their residential areas. And it's like, once this thing is in place, I am greatly concerned that it will then become the sewage treatment area for the island. And that concerns me greatly. I, you know, if we're gonna use 2% land, then let each area, Ram Island, Silver Beach, wherever, take one of their 2% parcels and treat their 
specific area. This, is, this, this part of Shelter Island does not have an association, sadly, to defend ourselves. But we all have very strong feelings about this part of the island. I don't put anything on my lawn. I don't put any poison. I don't put any, anything on my land. I'm an organic gardener. I'm a composter. And I have been for the entire time I've lived here. And it really concerns me what is going into the aquifer. This is something I really want to say to the Green Committee member. And when we're, to, we need to start practicing best practices. Shelf Island needs to start thinking about what kind of uh, detergents, I don't use detergent, what kind of detergents we're washing our clothes with that are going in the aquifer. You know, it's not just pharmaceuticals. What kinds of cleansers are we cleaning our toilet bowls out with? You know, are they benign plant-based? Uh, biodegradable, non-hazardous, or are they something that doesn't break down? And those are the things I would like to see the town take a real active stance on what goes in the ground versus, well, we've got this water, it's got a nitrate problem, we're gonna ship it somewhere and take the nitrates out. I would like to see it, people taking care of it at the source. When you have a lawn, no, don't cover it with poison that gets rainwater, percolated into the drinking, the, into the aquifer. We need to take care of our aquifer individually as homeowners and citizens. And, and, and let's talk about the greater good. You know, I mean, Jim Colligan talked about a sacrifice for the good of the town. You know, maybe we need to change the way we wash our clothes. Okay, Penny, I think, I think we're gonna move that. I appreciate everything you said. And we- Well, anyway, thanks for listening. I'm glad you finally, Listen, thank you. Anybody else want to speak? Just to let Penny know, last night at, CA, at CAC meeting during, uh, we put on the February uh, agenda, the use of herb, herbicides or pesticides. Penny, you're 100% correct. There's, there's got to be other efforts other than what we're talking about here to, to treat our land better. So I think the CAC for one, and maybe some other committees uh, need to take a look at this but we, we use way too many herbicides and pesticides on this island, way too many. Peter Grant? Yeah, um, I am also appreciative of what Penny was saying, and I think that the WAC is also going to be taking on uh, aggressively uh, the use of pesticides and herbicides. Um, I also have, a, a, I'm sensitive to and, and, and am uh, um, sympathetic with the concerns of people who are living in the who live in this in the area of Klinowicus and not becoming you know the destination for all waste, um, I would urge everybody to look closely at uh, the specific work being done on siting that Joe's referenced um, to ensure that um, the siting is actually downstream of the freshwater. Uh, um, uh, ponds and downstream of the home of homeowners uh, and not upstream of them. I think that people should pay a lot of attention to the fact that um, right now what's being placed into the ground at the municipal buildings is a complete unknown. We just, it, we have no access to actually analyzing what is being added to the aquifer and eventually moving its way past all of the homes between the town center and the uh, uh, saltwater boundary at the, at the bays. Uh, whereas now with a system that's bringing that effluent beyond the intakes of everybody's homes, uh, hopefully uh, closer to the saltwater boundary, but not right into dumping into the bay, mm -hmm. we now have the opportunity to, exa to examine what we're doing uh, and to look at the total contribution from all of the buildings in the municipal area uh, and from all of the people who use those buildings um, see that pooled and understand our problem and mitigate against every harm that that, that, that brings us. Um, so I think that the goal here is cleaner water at, in the center, but also cleaner water in Cockles Harbor and even cleaner water in Klinowicus in the area of Klinowicus. Um, and certainly with the knowledge of what it is we're doing and the ability to address the problems that we haven't been able to take into account yet. Okay, Wendy, I see you raising your hand. You have to unmute yourself first. 
Wendy, you have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was beautiful. But I think Peter, who I don't know, just, just said. Also, John and Penny Kerr, Kathy and Gordon Gooding, uh, Tom Fields. I, I love hearing the locals. I am a local. I'm Wendy Clark. I'm married to a fisherman. I live on a most beautiful salt marsh, which embraces the most beautiful tiny cove, which is in direct line of the proposed facility. And uh, what Penny said about expansion was my real point. I can see a time where this becomes a facility for the, the whole island. And I'm so concerned about Cockles Harbor because that is what it is, a harbor. It doesn't get washed like, like the outer, outer reaches and beaches of this island. The water that flows in here uh, doesn't stagnate, but boy, it lingers in the salt marshes and there are many around this island. Uh, and I just think that Cockles Harbor is particularly fragile. So I'm just saying, uh, I won't be around when all this probably leaches into the water, but I hope we have the foresight and I hope we have the moral courage to stick with the people who thought their land was going to be preserved forever in that airfield. And uh, I hope we can find an alternative to that particular spot. That's it. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Anybody else? I see Lisa Richland. Okay. So, um, where is the money coming from to do this project? Is it all grants or is it coming out of my pocket? Uh, it hasn't been determined yet. We'll, we'll hopefully get as much grants as we can. There's a tremendous amount of uh, infrastructure money uh, available right now uh, that we're gonna be looking you know, for. I see. So um, if it's, if it's um, a mix of grants and um, my pocket, I, I be very happy to save five to seven hundred thousand dollars in addition to uh, not putting the effluent on a direct line to my water table. That's all. Thank you. Julia. Hi. Um, this may be for a later phase in this project, no matter where it lands. But I had questions, you know, a new system, we all assume a new system is working great. Um, a lot of the breakdowns that you read about in sewer systems tend to be in systems that are really old. But I do have questions about what are the plans to mitigate the risks in case of breakdown at the collection point, at the transmission point, and at the treatment point. And maybe that's something for Joe. Um, Julia, are, are you meaning uh, in, in the event of um, pump malfunctions or uh, line breaks or could you be more think, specific? Yeah, so I, like, um, I understand that, that this is being looked at for what the maximum capacity of these things, these different individual buildings are, which is why the community center ends up with this sort of outsized contributing role. Right. Um, but one of the things about the center is it's also the location that we use for our emergency shelter. If we were to have a hurricane, for instance, there might be quite a bit of demand on those very buildings. Um, I don't think it would go beyond what you're anticipating, but there certainly would be a concentration of demand. So in that instance, are these septic tanks that are being created in these new spaces you know, are they designed to a capacity for the maximum capacity so that there won't be backups? Um, what if there's a great deal of saturation during an event like a, a storm into the water around that could cause upheavals in the pipeline? What if it's a winter storm event where there's a great deal of saturation and then there's a freeze that causes an upheaval? It's a very long pipeline. So what are the risk mitigation that goes into that? And also the same at the treatment center. If this is a very large, shallow drain field, if there is one of these major flood events, what are the dimensions? How, how, how do you uh, 
leave room in that large shallow drain field for those kinds of large flood events that might occur. And again, it might be something that's more a technical thing about the design, but I'm hearing a lot of people concerned about the system running at its best. And I guess the question is what happens 10, 15, 20 years down the road if there's an accident or something occurs that's outside the norm. Mistakes happen. Certainly, yeah. So uh, like, like most uh, you know, major infrastructure projects or even uh, you know, uh, highly engineered systems there, they are considered to uh, have uh, uh, functionality as ab absolutely uh, critical. So there's uh, a number of redundancies which are engineered into the system to allow it to function in these adverse conditions, similar to how you mentioned that our flow calculations are for worst case scenarios and don't actually represent what you'd see on a daily basis. That's that's a good example of the type of engineering that goes into uh, preserving functionality so that in that odd event where that crazy day where uh, everybody's in school and there's a gigantic event at the Legion Hall and then everybody leaves and goes over to the town hall, you, you see these unusually high flow rates, you know that the system can incorporate that. And similar types of redundancies are taken throughout the system in the various, in the various places, backup power for pumps when needed, um, uh, bypasses when needed, uh, auxiliary treatment when needed. And so uh, overall, the, you know, the, the view towards designing these types of systems is that they have to function all of the time and you've got to provide the redundancies so that they, so that they, uh, so that they do. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question specifically. And there's a number of um, you know, technical nuances that go into the design and, and, and we're not at that phase. But uh, one thing that is advantageous about these types of systems or one thing that we try to uh, take advantage of is uh, eliminating moving parts. So any opportunity for gravity to do work for you helps to eliminate the need for uh, you know an electrical component or a mechanical component. And um, one advantage to the airfield site uh, that hasn't been discussed yet is that it's generally uh, downhill in the path that we selected uh, from the center of town. There's one small uh, increase in elevation that we have for at this stage included a low pressure pump for, uh, but there is the possibility that that pump um, is not required. So uh, in those types of considerations are, you know, are made throughout the design. And um, those are all done with the intention of reducing the, the number of variables and ensuring system, you know, functionality. Thanks very much. And then there was one other thing. I had thought that the school, the school site itself was um, kind of ruled out because it was too close to other well locations. When you talk about that school site, is it the ball fields sort of right behind the school or the Fisk field site that that was referring to in the plan? In, in the report, they specifically uh, cited and uh, located the, the uh, the system at the ball field that's directly connected to the to the school structure, uh, but Fisk Field was while it's not included in the in the report was was you know also discussed um, and and the same for for the same reasons we're you know we're trying to prioritize uh, uh, not contributing to the to the hyper local center watershed and also uh, not to be space constrained and also not to have an impact on existing existing function. And so the you know, Fisk field and the school site to share those, those commonalities. Thank you very much. Okay, anybody else? Okay, so this is gonna obviously gonna be a continued uh, discussion. I'd like to, uh, next week we're gonna, uh, at our work session, we're going to uh, review the West Neck Water, Suffolk County Water uh, contract, uh, the draft of the contract. So I would like to the following week uh, come back with this. Uh, and by then, Joe, you should have the, uh, your, you said you have an updated uh, report for us? Yep. Okay, so we'll have time to uh, digest that. And uh, I think some of the committees probably meet before then so they can Put it on their agendas to discuss. So we'll 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 bring this back up January 25th uh, work session. Next week we're going to do West Neck Water uh, 
in the Suffolk County Water Authority operating contract. Uh, and I think that's it for this right now. And we'll move on to uh, board member reports. Uh, yeah, I, the only thing I have is uh, I got uh, two letters in the mail today. Actually, both Jim, Jim Colligan, they're both pretty much related to you. One was the uh, PEP management uh, uh, committee is, has their uh, annual, their quarterly meeting tomorrow. And the other one was uh, Suffolk County Planning Commission uh, would like to get together with us uh, and any uh, committees or uh, staff that we feel uh, necessary to go over uh, a number of items. Uh, real quick, I'll just tell you what they're, what they're thinking. We would like to set up a meeting with your planning department, planning board, ZBA, and as many other applicable town staff to review the Suffolk County Planning Commission's referral process and priorities. The purpose of this meeting is to discuss the referral process and to answer any process or qualitative questions you may have. Uh, we will update you on the various initiatives of the commission and observe the land use trends. Anyone that you feel uh, would be a benefit to the discussion should be included. It's a Zoom meeting and they're offering us uh, January 26th, 28th, or the 31st, uh, all in the afternoon. So if everybody could check their calendars and we'll get in touch with uh, all the committees and uh, you know, I'll send this out to everybody and anybody that would like to sit in on the Suffolk County Planning Commission's uh, presentation to us, uh, we'll do that. So first thing is we'll have to come up with a date, 26th, 28th, or 31st. That's a Wednesday, Friday, or Monday. So if everybody can look at that and let me know by next week. And uh, that's all I have. Go around the table. Uh, Amber? Yeah, the only thing I had was just the Suffolk County Water Authority contract that the town board reviewed carefully um, because that will be a, a detailed discussion next week. Okay. We need to keep moving forward on that. Yep, okay. Uh, Jim? Uh, last night the CAC met and we uh, discussed two applications, the SAPEN application. We ended up approving it 4-0. Um, there were some concerns uh, expressed with that application. Um, we did have, have uh, Matt um, Sherman on the, on the line last night, so we were able to you know, help with some of these applications and taking a look at them. Um, there was some questions about the, uh, the, the SAPEN application, by the way, is to uh, replace a dangerous a walkway in the back of the house coming down to the beach. Um, it's a very, very steep <clears throat> area. A uh, lot of engineering involved in that. A very big concern about the, uh, you know, the movement of sand there. Um, was it wasted effort? Um, how do you, it's so steep. How do you, how do you think that you can engineer this to make it last over a long period of time? But um, people are moving forward with it. Committee uh, set some boundaries. Um, the good news is that they're, they're looking uh, at other residents that have similar problems and the way they've handled them. So um, there's some construction protocol that needs to be looked at. Uh, these are very, very old steps that, you know, have become dangerous uh, to continue on. There also was a six inch pipe that needs to be removed uh, that comes out. Um, nobody knows why it was there, but it needs to be removed as well. On the Kushner wetlands, um, it, was, it was tabled. Um, there were some concerns there. Um, Matt has since, since the meeting was over, uh, looked at four different things that the committee uh, looked at. Number one, they need to move the driveway with the town board, uh, department with town building department approval. There was a hot tub that was placed in. <clears throat> Matt has recommended to the owners to take it out. Wasn't part of the wetlands application. It is in the wetlands area. That hot tub needs to be removed. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking for that. There's a new septic that's going in there. Um, it is shown on the new proposed site plan. Uh, our chairman, uh, Howard, brought that up that the, the site plan needed to be updated and there were certain things that were missing from that, uh, this being one of them. Um, they've added a blower and control panel next to the building 
And the overhead electrical has been removed and placed on the ground, which is something, uh, again, uh, one of the things that we did recommend that Matt look at is the vegetation plan, uh, a 15 foot wide non-turf buffer on the Northwest corner of the property that will help uh, regenerate or uh, revegetate the, with native uh, planting. So that was about it. So the, that was all Kushner, that second one? The Kushner was the second one, yes. How about so, McCarthy? Do we, we have any, no, we all McCarthy? McCarthy, uh, no, that's something we did not, those were the only two that were on there last night. Because I know I got a uh, letter from the architect saying, uh, you know, it was brought to the board in October and they're still waiting. So we have to find out where we stand with that one. I will, I will look when I get home on that one. Okay. Right? Um, and like I said, during the last thing, uh, we, we will place on the agenda for the February uh, use of uh, herbicides and pesticides, which is a, a real concern, a growing concern around the island for lots of people. Very quickly, we met last week <clears throat> on Tuesday with the Capital Planning Group, uh, the wastewater reuse project, the upgrading of the Heights Treatment Plan fertigation at uh, Shelter Island Country Club. Um, Stella and I and Joe met with Joyce Novak back on November 15th via Zoom. It was a good discussion. Basically, the thrust of that meeting was to bring Joyce up to speed on where we stand with the project. We then met again on December 27th uh, with the Zoom with Stephen uh, Hygen. Uh, he's a, from Cameron Engineering. He's an environmental engineer but with 30 years of experience. Uh, we discussed some things with him. Um, he's got a lot of good ideas and, and, and we're gonna uh, help pick their brain a little bit on that. We continue to seek funding for additional water modeling uh, to help with the cost of the $65,000 should we decide to go through with that secondary study that the Suffolk County Health Department has demanded that we take, which would take a look at that, you know, the impact of anything of recharging or irrigation on the existing wells in that area along New York Avenue. Since then, uh, Joe and I have been in uh, discussion and contact with USGS. Uh, we're hoping that uh, USGS might be able to do this study for us a lot cheaper, and they might have some preliminary work that we could, we could begin with. So that would be a great help. In terms of fresh pond feasibility study, we have received the draft copy from Lombardo, which will serve as a good starting point for a conversation concerning remediation of fresh pond. So we're, we're kind of, uh, that's where we are with that. Uh, in terms of municipal wastewater uh, treatment plant in the center of town, no need to go there because we just were there for the last hour and a half or plus or two hours. Uh, real point, um, dredging has begun last week by the county. This has become an annual event for maintenance of the uh, opening, the channel going in and out of, um, out of uh, Cockles Harbor. So that usually is about a two week project, anywhere from about six to 10 days, depending on weather. The county is exclusively taking care of that dredge. Uh, Crescent Beach bathroom has been updated. Uh, Brian and, and uh, Matt Sherman updated us. <clears throat> project cost is about $80,500, which is covered by um, mostly by our, our grant from the New York State uh, Parks and Recreation. Uh, our target date is still to have the new trailer in place by Memorial Day 2022. Uh, the, we can start on the preparation for the footings in the pavilion well before the arrival of the trailer, which I kind of see as a kind of a March, April timeframe. We're still trying to get um, to meet the MWBE. That's a requirement placed by the, the grant that we received. Uh, it, it affects approximately $34,000 of the original grant of 113,000 based on a, a formula for, um, uh, you know, that's, that's required in the grant itself. So we're looking at that. There is a uh, need to remove one of the telephone poles that are down there that we're working on that. Uh, Brian's working on that as well. Uh, the recycling roof, I'm happy to say is, is pretty much done. If you went there last night at the close of business, new lighting is in there. Uh, the roof is completed. Only thing that has to be done at the recycling center is the final paving, which will occur this spring. Uh, the reason we didn't do a final paving is we wanted to make sure that uh, we wanted to look at the water drainage, wanted to keep it away from the recycling equipment. So um, that doesn't mean 
you know, we will definitely, we have money in our budget to make sure that that uh, paving will take place sometime in the spring of this year. Hopefully, Jim, Jim, we're also waiting for the gutter installation on that. Oh, yes, that's the other thing we have. The, gutter, the gutters have to be installed on that. The nice thing about that on a rainy day, you can actually pull your car in underneath the, for the most part, the overhang and empty your car without getting rained on. And, uh, and obviously it protects, the, it protects the equipment that lies below it. So that's, that's important. Communities uh, Island uh, Community Center across the street. We still are seeking, uh, seeking additional estimates of concrete work. And I just want to remind everybody during COVID, getting bids back, uh, totally different process, not, not just getting materials, but getting bids, a very difficult process. Brian is trying very hard to, to, to seek some additional bids to lower the cost on that. But we will make sure that that entranceway is ADA compliant. The front door will be replaced and the overhang itself will be replaced. Um, that's all weather permitted as we move forward in, this, in the spring. We've established uh, our major goals for 2022. They are the four municipal wastewater being number one, the center of town, road elevations number two, particularly the, the, where we're looking at is Ram Island Road and the four ferry terminals are high on the list. We continue to make progress there. We, we have begun ADA compliance for some of the town buildings, particularly uh, police headquarters and uh, Justice Hall. So we will we'll, we'll end up uh, hopefully within the next five to six months with an ADA plan for all our town, major town buildings. Uh, then we need to work on how to execute that plan over the course of the next decade or so. And the last one is anything that we can do in terms of supporting the community's housing initiatives. Uh, Jennifer is working with uh, both ferry companies uh, on flood mitigations. And um, as I said, um, work, uh, working on ADA, that was, that was pretty much it. Um, one thing, the last thing I'll end on is uh, these CDBC grants, these uh, community development block grants, you know, that we've been getting for Ten, fifteen thousand, fourteen thousand dollars. We're thinking much bigger. The pot of money that our neighboring communities get run into uh, several hundred thousand dollars. This is a great way to help us in terms of ADA compliance. Obviously, we're not prepared to build a new police station or, or, or a new justice hall. So we'll be looking to increase that amount of money that we look through the block grants, and and our goal is to see anywhere from two to $300,000 worth of funding to help uh, make that happen for those buildings. As, as I just want to remind everybody that the town did get some grant monies and, and, and put some money in our operational budget for both of those buildings. Now we're pretty, are pretty much upgraded. You know, you know, new windows, new brick pointing, uh, stopped a lot of the leaks, um, some, some upgrades inside the buildings themselves. So, uh, we continue to make progress with our infrastructure. Um, and, uh, you know, within a matter of the next, you know, by, I would say by summer, our, uh, our full plan for, uh, uh, that we're gonna have for our uh, multi-year capital plan will be updated and everybody, the community will be able to see that. Obviously, when you come up with a multi-year capital plan, it's pretty extensive and it needs to be implemented over a period of time. So, you know, that's, that's something that, that that plan will call for. You know, what are we gonna do in the next year in 2023? What are we gonna do in that three year period between 23 and 26? How do we look from that five to 10 year plan? So it's gonna be very methodical and we're gonna prioritize what needs to be done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. BJ? CPF meeting uh, okay. yesterday? was just yesterday, feels like forever. Um, the it, a really good discussion about maintenance, ongoing sort of monitoring of invasives. And one really interesting idea was thrown out there that any property owners that are, that are adjacent to um, CPF lands might wanna take a proprietary sort of interest in helping to maintain them and keep them clear of invasives. I just think it's an 
It's an intriguing and neat idea. Um, also, Gordon is going to seek to have the, to reconstitute um, a, a group that composes all the, the, the five East End towns and their CPF committees or committee chairs. Um, uh, talking to uh, Fred Thiel about that to, um, to just, I, I think to just, uh, you know, uh, brainstorm new ideas and et cetera. Again, I think that sounds just like a great, um, a great idea for these times. And uh, uh, Meg, I think you'll talk about comprehensive plan. Yeah, yeah be, be, Meg, before you start, just uh, to reconstitute the advisory board. What that is, that's the five East End towns uh, each have a representative on it. And when any of the towns have a question pertaining to CPF uh, lands, uh, that group gets together and, and makes an opinion. Fred mm -hmm. had said that, uh, you know, because of COVID, it kind of, you know, went by the wayside for a while, but he's in the, I guess I couldn't say he's in the process of uh, getting that up and yeah. running again. Yeah. Meg? So we had um, our comprehensive plan reboot meeting last night, and we met with the members of the advisory committee. Um, everybody volunteered to come back, which was great. So um, we had our first intro meeting, pretty much talked about our ideas for moving forward. Um, BJ and I developed a plan that really uses the 94 plan as the backbone for our new plan and builds upon the 94 plan, taking into account um, the work done in 2008 and the work we've already done so far. So trying to merge all three of these plans and concepts um, and you know, really taking what we have and because the 94 is our current working comprehensive plan and building on it and realizing um, where we were where we have been and where we want to go. And I think having that foundation of where we've been is really good for um, kind of creating where we need to go. So I think um, the group was very optimistic that we could accomplish that. And we kind of came to the conclusion that um, if we got to a point where we felt like we needed consultants, we would reach out to the consultants that would be the most appropriate for whatever that topic or that issue were, was. Um, but we'd want to try to take like a good old college try at doing it ourselves first and kind of give um, that way if we do bring on consultants, we kind of have it going the direction we want. We have a foundation for them to look at and work from. Um, I think it's very hard for people to come to Shelter Island from the outside used to looking at larger communities with different needs and being able to meet the needs of this very unique community. So I think we have a better chance of making a document that reflects truly what the island is and where we want it to go um, if we're driving. So the committee felt very similar in that and um, we all agreed that you know if we did hit a roadblock and we needed outside advice that we would absolutely reach out and get it but that maybe we didn't need them guiding us through every step because um, at some points last round, it seemed misguided um, or just sort of out of touch with what you know we deal with on a daily basis. But other than that, it was a good step. Um, people were given homework to read the 94 plan and kind of think about the vision. And uh, we scheduled another meeting for the 25th 28th, 24th. 24th. Yep. So that's our follow up meeting. Um, so, yeah, that was what we worked on last night. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I sat in and observed you guys were in a really good meeting. That was nice. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Hey, Brian, I see Brian Sherman's here. Brian, Jim uh, mentioned Real Point. Did you want to say anything about uh, Highbury? Uh, we, Chesterfield came over this morning and uh, with a long stick and reached up into the, the jog at the beginning of the uh, canal that goes into the pond and, and got back all the silt that's been flowing up through there over the years. And uh, Brett is there with the town backhoe uh, finishing up uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, and this is the, the dredging we do every year uh, at that location. Uh, to get the pond to flow more. Unfortunately, 
our dredge window is September 15th to January 15th. And we always wait to the end of the, the window so we can get the most out of it for the year because they won't let us dredge again until September 15th. Usually uh, one or two nor'easters will uh, just, just put it back to where, where it is, is which it, it takes it all the way down to the beach where the rocks are to the south or to the west of uh, Hybrid Lane, but hopefully now that we opened it up a little bit more, uh, it'll stay a little bit longer. So Brian, when you say you opened it up, you, you kind of cleaned up the uh, the mouth of the actual marsh. So yes, which we haven't done in quite a while. Correct. Uh, the last time actually, uh, Petter did it, and he got stuck. Uh, so I had uh, Chesterfield come over with a long stick to reach in there uh, without uh, jeopardizing being being stuck. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Bob, did you have anything for us? No, Jerry, nothing today. Okay, I know we're working on some things uh, to fine tune some things with SharePoint and a few other things that you're going to uh, work with us on. Dottie, did you have anything? Just to remind you of your special meeting. Right. I, okay. We'll do a. Uh, We'll open up to the uh, public first, and we have a special meeting to uh, to a resolution establishing the uh, new co community housing uh, committee for uh, the governor's uh, as per the governor's uh, legislation, and also to appoint two members to it. Uh, uh, so, with that, I'll open it up to the public. Any uh, questions or comments, Howard? Yes, uh, I just want to comment on the report from Jim on the CAC. Uh, Last night, about 10 minutes after we were finished with the meeting, uh, Matt sent the revised site plan. Now, Matt is not a licensed surveyor. He should not be issuing survey plans. And I think he realizes that. And I think the town has to advise him that the code said it has to be done by a licensed surveyor for, for the wetlands. Uh, and I think we should just hold back until we get revised plans on that. Uh, that's the Kushner project. Um, and uh, I don't know if uh, Jim has seen what Matt has shown, but basically he was changing the plan like Etch-a-Sketch as, as we were talking. And uh, it's, it's required to be a licensed surveyor. That's what the code wants. And you know, doing it by CAD system online is not the solution to this. So I, I would advise the the board to request a license. Which, what was that? Which one was that? Yeah, but we, didn't you say? I thought your report said they approved it. We, no, we didn't it's approve Kushner. No. That was Sapin. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Kushner. We 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 because the committee wanted all these other things done. Right. Okay. And Matt was assuring the committee that all these things would be done within a matter of literally minutes by the end of the meeting. He was working on them as we met and, and he was trying to meet um, a, a, and, and probably came up short then, um, you know, as per you know, the chairman's uh, report. Yeah, what it was, Jim, just so you know, if you looked at the plan, he was changing things on his plan as we were talking and it's not an accurate survey even now. And I'm not gonna keep edited, editing his plans. He's gonna get a licensed surveyor, which is required by the town code to provide an up-to-date survey. Mm -hmm. So I would advise him, I, I'm just, I'm an advisory board. So I'm just telling the town board what I, I think. What, what items was he adjusting on the survey? He was adjusting. I said, you know, there's no no more uh, um, hot tub there. He took that out. I said there's no more uh, uh, gas tanks in that area. He took them out. We were adjusting the driveway coming in, uh, and he did adjust that. But then he didn't put on the the uh, finished pad by the uh, shed that's up front by the road. So there's items and the septic system. Uh, in the report, it's supposed to be like a mitigation to put in a new septic system. And it says we'll await wetlands approval. So if we're going to approve a wetlands plan, we have to have a licensed surveyor 
provide the plan. And as far as I know, Matt is a professional engineer. He's not a licensed surveyor. There's a different, big difference between the two. Right, but the surveyor developed the plan that Matt's working off of. All the things it's that he's adjusting are things that aren't permanent structures, correct? No, he was working off that plan, which was an outdated plan. It was in 21, but they had done much more work on that site than was shown on that plan. So it's, a, it's an outdated plan. We have to, I, 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 <laughs> I don't we'll know what the other time. We'll look at it. Okay, I appreciate that before our next meeting because we could bring it up at the next meeting again. Uh, anybody wants to discuss that, I'll be glad to do that with him. I, I know it's a legal documents that we have here. And then he, I sent the memo to the town board uh, 1229, I never got a response from the town board. I sent it to Amber, I sent it to Jerry, and I sent it to Jim Culligan. And no response. I called Jim Culligan. I got no response from my phone at that time. So can I just comment on that since you're bringing it up for a second time? I was going to I wasn't going to discuss this. Howard uh, and, and, the, and for everybody else that listens. If you don't think as a town board member, and first of all, it is the holiday season. My family, with my grandchildren, came out on the 28th. So the fact that you contacted me a couple of days after Christmas when my family was there, on a given day, we'll get on a, on a crummy day, 10 to 12 emails. On an average day, we'll get about 15 to 20. On a busy day, we can get as many as 30 emails generated just from the town email thing. I want to remind you, this is as much as everybody thinks it's a full-time job and we put a lot of time and effort into this. Uh, if you think that I haven't responded back because I'm not that kind of person that people know me, I call and I don't return phone calls or the email and don't. But since you brought it up a second time, I wasn't gonna, I, I just passed over it yesterday, but I'll be damned if I'm gonna pass over it a second time. We do our best. If you feel you haven't heard back from me, call me again. And I will promise you that I will get back to you. It wasn't the fact that I look at something and say, the hell with this guy. You know, it's Christmas time. My family's here. It's, it's a question of trying to, to do the amount of work that's thrown our way on a given day, even during the holiday season. So if you, if you want to, if you want to do this publicly, I'm prepared to go back to you publicly. I'd rather do it privately because it's a lot less, um, confrontation that's, that's why i public. called you that time jim i didn't want to do it publicly but that's well, what happened hey how are you doing your situation do what, do what okay you really need I, to I, I see matt sherman jumped on matt uh yeah. obviously you're the center of uh, this discussion you want to I do a back and forth on this but just to give you a real quick uh, synopsis of what occurred on kushner we had the uh, survey was done um it was done just over a year ago the end of 2000 november 2000 um, we had a DEC letter of non-jurisdiction. The property owner did work that was outside of the wetlands jurisdiction for both the town and the DEC. The licensed surveyor who did the survey in November, that was submitted to the town as part of the wetlands application. So Howard's 100% correct. You need a licensed surveyor to do a site survey. Then as a licensed design professional, myself or an architect, somebody who's not a surveyor, we can make modifications to that survey base map and submit it under our own stamp on our own title block. I can't change a surveyor's stamp survey. I'm not allowed to do that, but I am allowed to prepare my own site plan and we do it all the time. We do it with town applications, DEC applications and health department applications. Now, there, was, there were some things that were changed from when the original survey was done. Most of them were listed as things to be changed on my site plan, the reconfiguring of the driveway. Uh, that was the biggest one that I think threw Howard off when he was at the site. The, uh, the, the, the placement of the proposed improvements on site, the swimming pool and the uh, swimming pool equipment and dry well, things along those lines. So during the meeting last night, they were concerned about these and Howard felt that it was gonna be a, a confusing situation if the site plan did not reflect those changes. So I corrected my site plan that I created under my license and my title block 
with approximate improvement. I'm going to get the surveyor to update their survey now that we know that some other things have occurred, but as a licensed design professional, and Howard's an engineer, he knows this, I have the right to make my own site plan, which is what I did, which is what I always do. Uh, and then we, we, just as we did with this application, we submit the, the, the signed survey along with the signed site plan and both go to the town so that you can look at them and you can see if anything has changed. You can see it's right there in front of you in black and white. So nothing, it, this is just the way that the process goes when people are making changes to their site. Would it be useful if a property owner would hold off on making any changes other than mowing the lawn? Of course it would. Sometimes they don't, and we have to come back and adjust for it, which is exactly what we're doing in this situation. So, Matt, you're saying you're going to get the surveyor to give us a new survey? Yes. Okay. Well, that's all we need is a, a, a licensed survey to do that. And then you use the background. I've used the background of the survey to put my work on. It's a, it's a, it's a common mm -hmm. process for professional engineers. Yeah, that, that's a little bit of a different feel for what was just said, but we'll let that slide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julia, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I just have a question um, that refers to the new roof at the recycling center, which is awesome. It looks amazing. Um, and that is um, a part of my commute in my former life was under the Roslyn Viaduct in Nassau County. And for anybody who ever had to drive on that road, you know that if you get to the traffic light where the viaduct crosses the road, you don't stop under the viaduct. And that's because the viaduct was inhabited by huge numbers of birds who would poop all over your car. So my question is, is there a plan to mitigate um, bird nesting in the sort of eaves of that roof um, or anything of that sort with netting or whatever it might be? Just wondering. Ryan, I'll, I'll leave that to you. I know uh, other than the gutters, we're going to put the ice uh, shields on. How about uh, bird nesting? Um, if we feel the need, uh, we'll look into it. But we, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to have uh, a problem with birds. Uh, we never really thought about that, to tell you the truth. Um, but I guess we'll have to watch out for that. Good. OK. All right. Anybody else have anything? No, just I sent Julia and Julie uh, the, the copy of the uh, capital planning final report. So I, I did send it to you just now. Okay, good. Okay, uh, I need to make a motion to go into a special meeting for a resolution regarding the uh, community housing. Oh, wait, Tom Field, do you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, Jerry, I had a couple of points I wanted to make from the Bayman to the town board. I don't know whether this is the appropriate meeting to do that or not. Um, should I wait? Tom, I was going to, I was going to try to put you on the agenda and get uh, some of the committees there with you. Uh, unless, you know, it's just things you want to, you know, food for thought for that meeting. It's up to you. Yeah, that's really what it was. It was just kind of things that we'd like to see, uh, um, you know, looking at in the, in the future and uh, maybe just give you a heads up of some things. Okay. Well, I, give us a list. Go ahead. Okay, um, one thing was the shellfish closure. You and I spoke about that ourselves, see if we can get a letter or something to the DEC regarding um, the future of that closure remaining open. Um, right now it's closed for the season, uh, the year, and it won't open this year. Um, you and I discussed that. Maybe something can be done there. Yep. Um, the, uh, it's come up about the definitions that you're uh, proposing. Um, we'd like to see at this point in time that perhaps we can leave chapter 108 out of the proposed de definitions there, um, because uh, specifically regarding resident, that doesn't meet the shellfish um, code, so to speak. And we would like to discuss that further when we go back to when you go back into the meeting there with the yep. dis discussing them. Um, the commercial harvester permit, we'd like to see... Uh, the discussion start on that. Um, you have some of the paperwork and yep. if you don't, I have it. Um, what else? Um, it's good to see that the pesticide fertilizer thing is going to finally be discussed. Um, we'd like to be involved in that because we have some very strong points there that we'd like to make. Um, and uh, where else were we? Um, the uh, uh, You mentioned last week that you're going to be addressing chapter 19, which is the mooring chapter. Um, we also believe that perhaps chapter 108, the shellfish ordinance should also be 
looked at at the same time or you know as well as um and before any of those two chapters looked at um we think that the conflict of interest in the waterways committee must be addressed before those are looked at um and we'd also like to see a bayman um or commercial fisherman with a permanent seat at that waterways table um so th things to consider obviously um and i have what else is on my quick list um the floating docks um that's still a mess that situation uh, maybe we can send a building inspector out and look at what's going on there um they're all over the marsh and you know the problem was never really solved um it, it persists um and the last thing i wanted to check on was the congdon creek dock the uh, rebuilding of the bulkhead, is there a schedule for that? And also the extension, there was talk of an extension to that dock. Is there some sort of uh, timetable when that's gonna get done? Or? Uh, yeah, we actually, we had, we had the money and we had it scheduled for last year, Tom, but we had the uh, catastrophic uh, Dawn failure Lane. at uh, Dawn Lane. So yeah, Brian, you wanna speak to that. it? That, that was understandable. We're just wondering when the, when the day was yeah. pushed forward for that. Brian? So, uh, I had the permit for the dock extension. Uh, the DEC kicked back the permit for the, the new bulkhead. Uh, I need to get the, uh, the wetlands flag and then resubmit. And I'm waiting for uh, end consultants uh, to flag the wetlands and a uh, new surveyor to uh, put that on a survey to resubmit with the DEC for the permit. Oh, okay. Right, so and any ballpark on how long something like that'll take? Uh, I'm supposed to have the wetlands flag within the next two weeks, um, and then hopefully soon after the survey done, um, and then uh, to resubmit. The, the DEC knows I'm, I'm eager to, to get this permit and get this job on, uh, uh, get it out to bid and get it done. Okay, and just so everybody knows, the extension is uh, for the police boat. It's, it's not we're not moving the dock, you know, away. We're putting one more uh, slip at the end for the police boat. Okay, thank you. I guess a year out on the bulkhead then, probably with the DEC involved like that, right? No, no. No, no, I don't think so, Tom. Oh, okay. Okay, well, appreciate it. That was pretty much it. Um, like I said, right. So, Tommy, I'm going to schedule people. something for the Bayman in February, and we'll get the WMAC there and uh, invite the other committees also. Okay, thanks, Jerry. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, town board. Thanks. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna make a motion. We uh, go into a special meeting uh, regarding community, uh, Dottie. First of all, you need to do a motion with favorable approval to go into a special meeting because we this is not a scheduled meeting. So you need okay. to do it, okay? Okay, so what Dottie just said, I'll make the motion. Okay. I have a second? <laughs> second. Second. Okay, Councilman Colligan seconds. Councilman Brock Williams. Aye. Councilman Lawson. Aye. Councilman Ian Fowler. Aye. Okay, so moved. Uh, I don't have the resolution. Dottie, do you have it to read? I, I do. do. Oh, Amber does. Amber has it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And Jerry, just to correct what you said earlier, um, you said we we're going to appoint two members so far, but we're actually going to appoint seven. Um, oh, yeah, we're good. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's we're appointing to the Community Housing Fund Advisory Committee. And just so that we can get them to start being able to meet, we're not done um, uh, staffing that committee. We have, um, we're gonna put you know, something out to try and draw some more interest and cover the positions that are not, that need to be covered that aren't, but we wanna at least get them started. Right, so, and the criteria was seven to 15 members. Correct, yes. Okay. And so we need yep. financing, we need construction, real mm -hmm. estate. We have some of those filled in here, um, but anyways, just- okay. Whereas pursuant to town board resolution number 81-2022 dated January 7th, 2022, the board established a community housing fund advisory committee to consist of at least seven members and no more than 15 members. Now, therefore be it resolved that the following persons are hereby appointed to serve as members of said committee for terms of two years each, said terms to expire on January 11th, 2024 as follows. Brand Artie, Christopher Diorio, Paul Caruccirullo, Peter McCracken, Maria, Maria Magenti, Elizabeth Hanley, and Michael Shatkin. So moved. Supervisor Silla seconds and votes aye. Councilman Colligan? Aye. Councilman Lawson? Aye. Councilman Ian Fowler? Aye. 
Okay, so moved. Okay. Amber, how, many, how many does that give us total? That's seven. seven. Uh, seven. We need, uh, that, that, so we made the minimum requirement, but we still have to meet the requirement, Jim, of uh, yes. specifically a builder and uh, yep. you know a couple other things. Finance, I think. Mm -hmm. Like banker kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dottie, anything else on your end? Me? No. Okay. All right, I'm going to make a motion. We go into an executive session. We have a couple of uh, personnel uh, issues we need to discuss. And I would ask uh, Joe Fenora, Jim Reed, Reed Karen, Christina, and Brian to stay on. Councilman Colligan seconds in both sides. Councilman Brock Williams. Aye. Councilman Lawson. Aye. Councilman Ian Fowler. Aye. Okay. So moved. All right. Thanks, everybody, for the input today.